All right, it looks like we're live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our December 14th, 2020 school board meeting. Um, I invite you all to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And again, I thank you all for being patient as we came in a little bit late from our closed session meeting. And I just want to uh, let you know that there was no action taken in regards to um, our personnel. And we have directed our superintendent to negotiate a payment to CSEA and OFT using our CARES funding to be spent by 1231 at the end of the month um, to be for formalized at a public meeting next week. So that's what closed session looked like. Um, are there any emergency modifications or changes to the agenda additions? If not, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll move to approve. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Kevin. Um, all in favor, Kevin? You never start with me. I. <laughs> I can't find anybody right now, so I'm I'm just going blind here. Um, Thane. Aye. Jane. Aye. Michael. Aye. And Shelly, aye. And we will be soon having a new board member tonight, but for now, um, Thane is our current board member. So um, I'm looking for any corrections to the minutes for uh, November 18th and for the December 3rd meetings. And if there are uh, no- I'll, um, I'll have a motion to approve the two with the changes on, um, in uh, item 6.5.2 on the November 18th, uh, the minutes should read, we waived the second reading of the board, not the first reading, board uh, approval policies, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I'll that, second the motion. Thank you, Jane and Thane. All in favor, Thane? Aye. Jane? Aye. Michael? Aye. And Kevin? Yes. And Shelly, aye. So that passes unanimously as well. And now we are at our swearing in. And I don't know what this looks like this time. And I can't find you, Tiffany. There aye. you are. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to read the oath of office per government code 1360. And I am going to read it for both Rebecca and Shelly at the same time. You will obviously say your name, not and just your name. And then um, I am going to also identify um, that Rebecca is in trustee area two, correct? And Shelly is in trustee area four. So you will repeat after me and I will try and have small chunks for you. Although sometimes I'm not very good at this part. As a governing member of the Ojai Unified School District, a governing member of the Ojai Unified School District. In trustee area, state your area. In trustee area, or I, state your name. I, Shelly Kramer. Do you solemnly swear? Do you solemnly, do you solemnly swear, swear? That I will support and defend the Constitution. That I will support and defend the Constitution. Of the United States. The United, the United States. States and the Constitution of the State of California and, and the Constitution, Constitution of the State of California, of California against all enemies against, against all enemies, enemies foreign and domestic foreign and domestic foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance that I will, that bear, I will bear true faith, faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely 
without any mental reservation. That I take, I this, take obligation this obligation freely, freely without, without any mental, mental reservation, reservation. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And, and that, that I will well, well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Discharge the, the duties, duties upon which I am about, I am about to, enter. to enter. Congratulations. You are both board members. And Should welcome, Rebecca. <laughs> and a salute to Thane Whipple. Thank you so much for your service. I was oh, thank you and congratulations, Rebecca and Shelley, for the election. And I, I wish you all the very best uh, tonight and, and going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thane. I think Thanks. now's a good time to say good night and farewell. <laughs> <laughs> you're always welcome to sit through it with us. Thank no, you. You're, you're not going to stay. <laughs> good night. Good night, good night Thane. Thank you. All right, next we have item 3.2, which is the election of the governing board president. Uh, the board will elect the new governing board president. So, uh, and then the president will reside, preside over the remainder of the meeting. Is there a nomination for the uh, president for the 2021 school year or 2021? I will nominate Jane Weil for our president. I'll for the 2021 20, school year. Do you get my second? Yes. So nomination by Shelley, second by Kevin. Um, all those. I guess, oh, you do this part. I do, I do this one. This is my only <laughs> one once a year. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Uh, Shelley. Aye. Kevin. Aye. Michael. Aye. Jane. Aye. Rebecca. Aye. Was that everyone? Yep. Everyone. <laughs> Unanimously, welcome Jane. Thank you, I will be stepping in now. I don't know if I'll do as well as Shelly and I'll have to work my way through it, but we are on to item 3.3, .3, election of a governing board vice president. Is there a motion for vice president for 2021? I'll move to um, uh, elect Kevin as the vice president, Kevin Ruff. I'll second. Thank you, Michael. All those in favor of Kevin as vice president? Shelley? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Michael? Aye. Kevin? Aye. And Jane? Aye. That passes five to one. I'm sorry, five to zero. I'm adding somebody. <laughs> Uh, 3.4, election of a governing board clerk. I would like to move to have Michael serve as our board clerk for 2021. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. second. Thank you, Rebecca. All those in favor, Shelley? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Kevin? Yes. Michael? Aye. And Jane? Aye. That passes five to zero. Congratulations, everyone. 3.5, certification of school board representative to the Ventura County Nominating Committee on School District Organizations. Um, I think Michael and I have shared this duty in the past. Um, it's a, kind of a one-time, once a year meeting and voting. Is there anyone who's interested in stealing that position from me? For next I'm year. happy to step in and, and take on those duties if you would like. Great. So I'll have a motion to elect Shelley to be our representative. All those in, oh, I'm sorry, do I have a second? I'll second. second. Um, Michael, sorry, we'll talk here from Michael. Don't all second at once as if you're exactly. trying to, you know, not have all this. All those in stop. favor? <laughs> Michael? Aye. Kevin? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Shelley? Aye. And Jane, aye, that passes five to zero. 3.6, approval of board education meeting minutes for 2021. Is there any concerns about those dates that were printed for public? I had a question. Uh, uh, it, we have the December 15th date on there. I meant to ask you about this, Tiffany. 
Um, but we know that we usually have to move it forward. I'm wondering why we don't have it on December 14th so that we can make the December 15th deadline. Um, I think that we can, as long as we pass, we certify our first interim on December 15th, it should be fine. Um, and since we don't have an election next year, I think that should be the correct date. And I we also, um, we went through all of these dates to make sure that they don't conflict with any Ventura Unified date. So if we wanted to change one, we would need to go back and, and make sure that we're not double committing any of our board members. Sounds okay. good. So we'll keep it for the 15th so that we have a chance to check uh, Rebecca's schedule for her meetings, but you're right, Shelly, otherwise we should probably move it to either the 13th or 14th, and we'll do that next fall. So is there a motion to approve the schedule as written? I'll move to approve the, the dates for the upcoming year. I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor? Shelly? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Michael? Aye. Kevin? Yes. Jane, aye. That passes five to zero. Four point one OUSD value awards. I believe Tiffany, you're going to introduce these. It will actually. Our first value award uh, for our Rotary Peace Ambassador um, and value award is going to be introduced by Sarah Ferranti. And I would like to point out that the Topa Principal Don Damianos is here to support both. Sarah and the student. So Sarah, would you like to introduce your award winner? Oh, it would be my pleasure. Good evening, everybody. It is so nice to see all of you there. I haven't seen um, a lot of our administration on campus because of our closures and it's just great to see everybody. So, so many nice familiar faces and I hope you're all doing well. It is an absolute pleasure this evening to introduce one of my students. Daisy. And uh, Daisy is so deserving of the Creativity Award. She, she's not only creative, she is a super enthusiastic student. And she is always coming up with ways to go above and beyond with her, her work. She loves to make slideshows and make them creative and add a lot of um, oh, pictures and music and so forth. But one of the things that I appreciate the most is that when she comes up with these creative ideas, she also is trying to include other students. Um, she builds our classroom community. She makes learning really fun and she puts a smile on everybody's faces with her ideas. Um, she has great ideas. When I'm trying to think of an, a reward that students can work towards, Daisy thinks of one and she helps me to come up with class rewards. She comes up with great ideas for things that we can do during our Zoom meetings for Fun Fridays. She always has an idea for an art project or just in general, a way to make school fun. Um, in her spare time, Daisy loves to draw. She's a very creative um, artist, super artistic. She likes to surprise people with decorated cards and pictures and drawings that she's made. Again, always putting a smile on other people's faces. Um, I brought a little sample of something that she made for me. And she, this is the type of thing she does all the time. She'll make a, a little card for you and draw a picture of you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she puts a smile on my face and she makes our meetings fun, both at school when we were in person and through Zoom sessions. So Daisy, thank you. Your, creative, your creativity touches me but our whole classroom, your ideas bring a lot of enjoyment to everybody. So thank you. Thank you for your creativity and don't ever lose it. Keep it up. I would like to introduce Michael Weaver, who is the head of the Rotary Peace Committee and sponsor of this award. Michael, would you like to say a few words? Surely. Yeah, thank you, Tiffany. Uh, yes, uh, just a little background. Uh, Rotary joined uh, the the OUSD uh, uh, in a promoting the the values award because it lines up very well with what we call our four-way test. And tonight we'll be awarding uh, the two students that are being mentioned and, and recognized with a $50 check for them 
and fifty dollars for their the nonprofit of their choice. And so we're very happy to to participate in this, and we're very proud of what you're doing. And thank you very much. And Daisy's nonprofit of choice is the Humane Society. Daisy, would you like to say something? It's just I've been, I haven't been talking lately in the Zoom. I feel a little shy. <laughs> That's okay. You don't have to. <laughs> All right. So next up, we have... Congratulations, uh, Daisy. <laughs> next up, we have our chaparral student who was selected by Mr. Andrews. And we have Mr. Andrews here to talk about it. And he sent me some photos. So I'm going to pull up... Um, I'm going to pull up those photos really quickly. And I see our principal, Javier Ramirez. And here. Javier well. Ramirez is here as well. So um, take it away, Ms. Andrews. Uh, yes, good evening. Uh, so tonight, um, the uh, faculty from Chaparral High School um, uh, elected this, this week. Actually, I think it was last week. Uh, we we made the decision to uh, uh, pick uh, Robert Myers uh, for this award. And it's not just for creativity, but also for service, because uh, he's really, uh, really been engaging with the school and in such an unusual year uh, to have, and he's new with Chaparral this year, as am I. So uh, neither he nor I know what it's like to uh, have a regular school year on, on this campus. And he is just really engaged with uh, any opportunities that uh, have been offered. Um, he is active with the horticulture program. And if you go over into the courtyard in front of our classrooms, you can see the beautiful uh, planting beds he's been working on. And probably three to four days a week, he sticks around after school um, till two to three to four o'clock. Uh, and as you may know, Chaparral has this weird hybrid schedule where the students have been uh, showing up just with their uh, advisory cohort and then being dismissed at 11.30 a.m. to uh, uh, go home and work further on their studies. Uh, but we've been um, trying to get some arts programs up and running this year, and uh, we've got a, a great cohort of students who've been working, and Robert has shown leadership and has helped to train his uh, peers on how to use the lapidary machines. We have some diamond uh, grinding wheels and a diamond saw. And um, here you can see a picture of him using the flexible shaft machine. And this is a young man who's just an absolute natural at uh, creating. And uh, I mean, the first time he put a stone to the wheels, it was like, He'd been doing it for 30 years. And uh, I, I also want to point out he's artistic uh, just independently as well. He's an amazing artist in his drawing and uh, creates avatars and characters for gaming. Uh, he authors and writes plots for gaming. Um, and, uh, you know, he's also a student in my English class who has elected to go above and beyond the uh, uh, adapted literature that we have for our special population at Chaparral. And he's, he's reading Shakespeare's Macbeth as we speak. You know, he's in the middle of reading uh, the, uh, the canonical text. And this is a choice we don't see too many of our students at Chaparral make. And uh, I, I kind of extol it as, as a model for the fact that uh, we're a campus uh, to just meet students where they are, and he's taking the initiative to push himself uh, in his studies as well as in the arts. So uh, we couldn't have thought of a more deserving candidate in our students this year for this uh, honor. Very good. Uh, can I can I add something really quickly? Mm -hmm. I just really quickly I want to point out that um, he is. Robert just completed his entire math credits a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he submitted his last credits to me. I graded them, I put them in the computer, and I think that probably was the happiest day in his life so far. He's completely <laughs> done with math, high school math, so congratulations to him. He's a great student. 
We're so happy to have him. And I just want to echo everything that Greg already said. Congratulations, Robert. Congratulations, Robert. That's a beautiful piece. And Robert's uh, also, Robert gets $50 for himself. And then he has selected the immigrationequality.org for his donation. Robert, would you like to say anything? Uh, not particularly. I'll just like to thank my teachers and stuff. Uh, I didn't feel like I was doing anything extra, uh, but yeah. Excellent. Right. And Michael, anything else to, to share? Well, certainly I want to congratulate both students and uh, I think we're very proud of their accomplishments and encourage them to keep going. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all very much. Hey, may I jump in and just say we have a couple of other students who are or one other student and another award winner for our kindness award. That is included in our superintendent's report, which is a couple of items from here, not too long, but I just wanted to let you know that we didn't forget about you. You're just coming up in another in another section, if that's all right. So would it be okay, uh, Tiffany, if we went ahead and honored them right now? If you would like to, we certainly can do that. Let me sure it uh, feels appropriate if that's okay. I am just fine with that. Um, I have to find my so we have the Todd Chandler Award, which is for kindness and friendship. And this is a brand new award to us that was brought to us by the Reverend uh, Marilyn Miller. And so this is a $50 cash award that's given to one teacher and one student in elementary each year who demonstrate acts of kindness. So this month we are honoring Miners Oaks and we have Mrs. Teresa Dutter here tonight with us. And we are going to start with Maximilian Mayers, and I believe we have teacher Amy Mendoza here tonight to introduce our student. Well, I am so pleased and honored to introduce you to Max. And I have something to read to you. I had reached out to the help of Ojai to ask if we could write letters to seniors and shut-ins um, uh, through Meals on Wheels. So I spoke with a woman who said she was very happy and the seniors love to get letters and messages. And I just want to read, I think this really is a short way. I told Max I could talk about him forever, but I think this completely sums up his letter. I don't know if you can see this because I think um, I could share, I don't know if you can see his letter, but I will read it to you. This is from Max. Dear friend, happy holidays. Hope you are safe and warm. You're not alone because my heart is with you. I am staying home to keep you safe. Hope you're staying the safest you can be. I am thinking about you. Hope you are happy. This healthy meal was made with love and care. When you feel lonely, read this letter again. I'm sending a smile, laughter, and happiness to you. Hang in there from Max. And that perfectly sums up Max, right? And you would think, I know you may think, oh, his parent helped him with that or somebody fed those words to him. That is Max 100%. Max is the kindest, sweetest boy you would ever want to meet. And it's a complete honor to have had him in my classes the second year. Do you want to say anything, Max? Oh, he's going to take a drink. <laughs> Well, thank you for giving me this award, and that's basically it. Just hey. thank you. What did you say, Max, when I told you you Have were you getting the? What did you say to me when I Have told you? you Max, Max, can you tell us what you said to me when I told you you were going to get the award? I, um. I just don't like seeing people really that sad. That was his response when I told him he was getting the kindness award. Max, you're a great kid. Yay. Thank Congratulations, you. Max. That was a very kind letter. Great job. One more. We have yeah. Stutter here to introduce our teacher who has been selected for the kindness award. It is my privilege, first of all, to say thanks to Max for being such a good example to others on campus when kids are here. 
Um, he truly is a very, very kind, wonderful boy. So I'm really glad he's part of our campus. And in like kind, we have a fabulous teacher, Darianne O'Brien, who joined our team last year and immediately the campus was like, whoa, who is that person? She's got such good um, vibe. And um, everybody voted in is like, Darianne got this hands down when I put it out for a vote of like, who do you think we should honor for our kindness and friendship award? Boop. It was Darianne to no surprise. A couple things that people shared about her was that she has an, a, an inner shine that is visible to all. That is a direct quote. And um, well-deserved. She's one of the kindest, sweetest persons I know. We are so fortunate to have you. And um, her very uh, close colleague, Jan Geiser, is always um, a, a, a bring a, um, smiles and friendship to one another as well. They're two peas in a pod, but what she had to say really touched me. She said, kindness is spreading sunshine into other people's lives, regardless of the weather. And that was a quote that her friend Jan thought of when trying to describe Darianne. I thought, wow, that really captures it, it, it all. Um, Last year, when I was just trying to express to Darianne how much I appreciated having her on campus, I tried to, to express this, this bright shine that's in her eyes. She just kind of glows and that transforms everybody around her. They could be having the worst day in the world and Darianne comes in and poof, it's all wonderful. She just really lifts people up, gives them that word of encouragement that really makes a difference. And she does that day in and day out. And uh, one of our colleagues said that she embodies all that is kind, positive, and supportive. And I'd like to finish it up with a words from our office manager, Morgan Mitta, who sees everybody on their best or worst days. She said, Darianne is a true guiding light for our students. She always greets her, you with her gorgeous smile, followed by kind words. Her love and devotion for what she does pours out onto our staff and children whenever she's around. We are truly blessed to have her be a part of our Miners Oaks team. And I did of that 100% completely. I know Mrs. Mendoza feels the same way. So Darianne, thank you so much for all that you do for the students in our, uh, in our community, especially here at Miners Oaks. And thanks for all that you do for the adults around you as well. Thank you so much. You do an awesome job. I'd like to just say thank you very much. I feel very humbled and blessed to have been honored with this award this evening. Um, when Miss Dutter, when Teresa shared with me that I was receiving it, I was very surprised. And I really feel that um, I'm receiving this and accepting it on behalf of Miners Oaks Elementary School because it is an amazing environment. This is my second year and I feel like um, the atmosphere and the tone of the campus is one of support and love and compassion and kindness. So I think it's just um, very natural to, um, to extend that to those who have shown me so much of that. And I also just want to congratulate the other winners tonight. And also, I don't know who Todd Chandler is, but it's an honor to receive this award in his memory keeping his legacy and um, memory alive. So thank you very much. Thank you, Darian. Thank you, Max, and our presenters. And uh, finally, we're at our OUSD Volunteer Award. So tonight we are honoring Ben Roman. If you have driven down Ojai Avenue past Matillaha, you have seen this gorgeous new mural that he painted for us and um, has spent many, many weekends working on. It was, a, it was a labor of love for sure. And also in partnership with the Matillaha PTA helped with this and the funding behind this and Ben, um, donated his time for this. So we are grateful for all of the beautiful artwork in Ojai, specifically for this one, which you can see from the road. Ben, do you want to say anything about this? Um, well, thank you for having me in this meeting. I appreciate it. And I just want to thank you for this great opportunity that, for the project that Matilla Hall um, Music Department has given me and the support that I have from the community. Um, again, I, I was in the music department in 05 and 04. And um, 
I played the sax at the time and I just wanted to give back uh, a town a brand new mural, new edition. Thank you so much. It's the volunteers that make this district special. And we thank you so much for the many, many hours that you spent making this happen. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. Beautiful. Every time I drive by, I look at it. I'm like, ah, trying to look <laughs> at it and drive by. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone who joined us. Have a nice evening. We will now move on to our public comments. We do we have, have, go ahead. I don't know that we have any any general public comments. They're all for specific items. Specific items. I'm gonna just double check one more. So I did have, um, I think I actually I do have one from, uh, let's see, did he sign his name? Jim, didn't give a last name. Uh, Jim at Casa Ojai. I think that's for reopening specifically, but we it doesn't. Okay. We know okay. We, like. we will do it at that point then. Um, then we'll move on to 5.1.2 with our Student Advisory Council. Um, Shelly, would you like to introduce our, we now do have two freshman representatives, which we didn't have when we introduced our other reps. We do finally have two freshmen who braved the waters and decided to jump in and become our representatives. Um, bye, Max, are you saying bye? I'm seeing you wave up there. Yeah, goodbye. Good night, Max. Good night. So tonight, Good night. Joining us, thank you. Thank you, hon. Tonight we have Emma Holtney joining us and Bridget Griffin. I lost her. Oh, there she is. Um, as our freshman representatives. So this year we have an all girl crew as our representatives through all the, the grades. Um, so we would love to hear a little bit from Emma and Bridget to tell us just about yourself and um, maybe what schools you've gone to and what brought you to coming to become a, a leader in this respect. Emma, you want to start? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Emma. I play volleyball for Nordoff. Um, I do theater and I act and I sing. And I went to Topa Topa Elementary School from fourth grade on, and I also went to Matillaha. So I joined the council because it, you know, it just sounded interesting to me. It sounded like a fun extracurricular. Well, we're happy you're here. Thanks, Emma. Bridget? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Bridget. Um, I'm Shelly's daughter. Um, <laughs> And I've been at Topa, Topa my whole life. And then I went to Matillaha and now I'm a freshman at Nordoff. Um, all throughout Matillaha, I was in the leadership program and I am now at, in dance at Nordoff. And I joined the Student Advisory Council, just same reason, I thought it was interesting. And I guess I'm following in mom's footsteps. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're happy you're here. Thank you both for, for volunteering for this position because I know it's a bit nerve wracking and, and hard to jump in as freshmen and as freshmen who have not gone to school on your school campus. That's kind of a, a unique situation you guys are in. And so we are um, glad to have you representing your class and giving voice to those kids who are in similar situation as you guys are. Uh, we all met on Sunday to discuss the upcoming agenda. And um, Ella Ruff is here joining us as the other SAC student. Um, would you like to start Ella and, and talk to us a little bit about the, the SAC students met with the leadership students on Thursday, I think of last week to talk about reopening possibilities and, and what that would look like and give some student feedback on that. So Ella, if you would like to talk a little bit about that or Emma, if you guys have some input, tell us what that meeting looked like. Sure, um, I can start. Um, that was um, on Friday, we met with leadership and then t um, Dr. Morris and um, Mr. Munson were both there. Um, and they were explaining to us kind of what those different schedules would be looking like. Um, and it was really helpful to have a step-by-step. -step. Um, in terms of our opinions as a, like the students, we were super split. Um, 
I feel like freshmen and seniors were more inclined to wanting to go back to school um, in person, whereas juniors and sophomores were a bit more um, ex- like accepting of being in distance learning. Um, I don't know, Emma, if you were at that meeting, but if you want to add some more. Yeah, unfortunately, I was unable to be there, but um, honestly, I, I would love to go back, but the way things are looking right now, it just doesn't seem like a very safe option, but um, it would be it would, would be nice to go back, although distance learning has been very beneficial for me. Bridget, I can see your name is still there, so if you wanted to jump in on this too, because I think you were at that meeting, so if you have anything you want to add, you're welcome to jump in and, and add your point of view as well. Um, yes, I was at that meeting. And um, like Ella said, it was very split. Um, not only with wanting to go back, but the idea of how to go back and the two different um, ideas on like what days the groups come back, we were definitely split on those as well. Um, and like the entire meeting was uh, what should we do and like which one and who has more options on this and it was very split on everything we should do. So kind of it sounds very much like the whole rest of the community at large that it, this is not an easy decision and <laughs> um, it's hard to to make it work for everybody. Everybody has different opinions it sounds like. Dr. Morse you were in that uh, meeting too. So if you wanted to add anything, I thought I saw your mic click off. Um, I'm going to give almost the same exact presentation in a little bit on the item on reopening. So I'm going to show you the same thing that we showed the students. And I was going to say the same thing, which is that they were very split, just like the rest of the community. So <laughs> they already, they covered it all. I would just say one thing that they said that I thought was really nice was that they'd like to have more meetings like this with students. And um, Mr. Munson, I think, is going to talk about this. One of our goals is to bring student voice into the work that we're doing. Um, it's hard to do so. In it, like the, the place that you'll see in our presentation tonight took us a ton of hours to get to just that point where we can even have something to show you. Um, but we definitely, we've had town hall meetings for students. This, this was another way to try and increase student voice. So I was grateful for all the students who were there, showed up at eight o'clock on a Friday morning to participate and to give their feedback and um, advocate for their points of view and yet we're respectful of each other in the process. So it was great. Ella, I think you had a couple of other things you wanted to talk about too. Yeah, um, both the freshmen just joined us, which I'm super excited about to have some freshman um, voice in there, but I'm not sure if they know as much about the um, stuff we've been doing with leadership before. Um, we were doing, so leadership has a really good idea and Phoebe Dorn was kind of leading this with Ms. Cole Michaels, um, where they want to do some peer counseling. Um, so we're going to support them in that as much as we can, but that is their, um, they're heading that. Um, but we are going to try to support them with whatever they need, like getting out to the students. Um, but then something we're working on kind of talking about mental health is getting mental health um, days to be an excused absence. We're going to be doing a bit more research about that and probably have some more information later on. But yeah, that's something we're working on. One of the other things we talked about or that I heard <clears throat> in our meeting on Sunday was we had talked about um, teacher office hours and whether students were using those teacher office hours. And what I think I heard, correct me if I'm wrong, is that those kids who are using it, they're great resources, but that not everybody's using them and not all teachers are, are being used at that time. And so it might be something to, to talk to your friends about, about how those office hours are there to, to help and they really do help. Were there any other items during that Sunday meeting that you wanted to bring up? Separate from what the, I know you guys were gonna participate in our presentations in 6.1 and 6.2 and 6.3, but anything that was not included in those. I think that was it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that was it, yeah. That, I think that was, that's what I have written in my notes. Yeah. So thank you all for that. Um, Bridget, I don't know if you were planning on staying for the rest or, or just 
for the Student Advisory Council piece. So if you leave, have a good evening. And if you stay, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I think Ella and Emma have it handled for now. So mm -hmm. I'm going to head out. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. We now move on to 5.2.1, which is our CSEA President, Chuck Crawford. Good evening. Thank you for recognizing the classified employees right there at the beginning. Uh, I want to thank everybody for honoring the positions. Uh, it's a very difficult time, as we've seen with the students. I'm so grateful to see the students speak because that's really what this is all about. And seeing some of the things that I have this week uh, with the students, uh, it was very painful. Um, and I've shared that with some of the board members that I've seen um, because we know that's our focus. And, and so to see this positive presentation tonight is uh, encouraging for all of us. And thank you for that. Uh, the idea of honoring the position, I'm grateful to see that the Electoral College has uh, proven uh, to work the process. Um, and I think that's what we're doing here in a public meeting is proving the process. Uh, it's not about me or you, it's about us and we are working collectively and for you to recognize the classified employees. Um, uh, thank you because it has been a difficult as we all know. Um, and uh, to do the battle um, and make that decision about closing only to see the numbers get as high as they did this last week. Uh, thank you again. Uh, uh, I just, well, I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry, I'm short for words tonight. Um, I do want to just say thank you for the process and allowing the process to work. Thank you, Chuck. Um, Angie, speaking for the OFT. Hi everyone. Uh, I also want to say thank you, but first I wanted to say how fabulous it is to see my former kindergartners speak at a board meeting. It, it just like warms my heart and makes me so happy. Um, but on another note, um, I did want to say thank you for just looking at, at the numbers and paying attention to the science. And I know that like the, the girls were saying tonight and like we're all seeing everyone is split one way or another about what we should or shouldn't do and whether we should be back or not and how to make that happen. Um, what I wanted to say that both OFT and CFT, thank you for paying attention to the science and paying attention to the numbers and not being pulled one way or another based on people's opinions or their feelings or their own personal needs. Um, I know that as teachers, I, I know that we, we want to be with our kids. We wanna be with our students. It breaks really and truly, it just breaks my heart. And I know all the teachers are feeling this way in that we want to be with our students and we want to teach them in person uh, but we do really appreciate that you are paying attention and to the numbers and to science. So thank you. Thank you, Angie. Now we'll move on to 5.3, our superintendent's report. Share my screen with you. To present mode. So we have, um, as is customary, the start of our superintendent's report is my favorite part, our standing ovations. These are our departments that have been recognized. And uh, we start with nutrition services team and two came in for David Rogers and all of the great work that he is doing. And I'll read one of those to you in a moment. We have a nominee for Ms. Dutter and her great work that she is doing every day. We have some teachers at Miramani, Chris Hess, Pam DeCola, Nadine, Tina Muller, and Natalie Nystrom, who used to be Hay, if you may know her that, all um, written for, by parents and grandparents. We have two at San Antonio, Ann Gard and Kim Eck, written by parents. And we have many at Topa, 
We have Alex Rodarte, who is our ABC Club instructional aide, Tracy Oakland, Amanda Belcher, who is our new office manager there. We're very excited to have her there. We, she was previously our ABC Club coordinator and we had an opening and she was selected to be the office manager at TOPA. We have our new custodian, Mark Prado, and um, Sarita Davis, ABC Club supervisor, and Xander Garcia, our custodian. All submitted by um, either the principal, Ms. Damianos, or family members and parents. And finally, at Matillaha, we have our new custodian, Roy, who's just joining us, who was nominated by Chris Murphy. And I'm not reading to you all of these because um, I know they can be a little bit long, but I do want to right after this next slide that I forgot about, um, read some of the, the highlights. So at Nordoff, we have Sarah Escobar, um, Sayuri, Amy, and Michelle for all of their great work that they're doing supporting kids. And I will read just a few of these. Um, this one is for the nutrition services team, which has gone above and beyond with the food. It is all fresh and super healthy, which was our goal. If you remember a year ago, that was one of the things we wanted to start doing. I hope you never discontinue it. Francis is so willing to share the recipes too, which I think is great that you can go home and make the same food. When kids are going home and they wanna make the same food they had at school lunch, we're doing something right. Um, that is from Maria. Secure Beginnings, which you will hear about a little bit later tonight. Um, they wrote this one for David Rogers. Secure Beginnings was recently invited to hold a diaper bank at the district office. David Rogers has been exceptionally supportive to us for the move to the district and to orchestrate the many details of diaper delivery, storage, and disbursement. And we're so thankful. So we're glad to have people on our staff who know the values of partnership and work really hard to make sure that we can pull those partnerships off. And that is from Renee, the executive director. And then finally, David Rogers, Michelle Gorell, and Amy Zuniga have been pivotal in helping to create systems to organize and track requests for family fund and homeless and foster youth students and parents. Their efforts go beyond education to a level of care that affects quality of life for many of our students and families. And I'll talk in just a moment about some of our efforts and you'll see that it is actually a tremendous amount of work. So we could not do that without this team. Excuse me one second. So I want to just point out, we have in the last month been trying to really recognize our staff and our community. This sign you may have seen was over um, downtown Ojai for a few days, thanking our teachers the week of Thanksgiving. It had a short run. It, was, it will be going back up at some point, but if you missed it in a short, short run, I wanted to make sure you had an opportunity to see it. And then finally, we have some banners thanking the um, community for Measure K. And I will say all of this was funded by Friends of Ojai Unified School District who paid for these banners, I'm thinking. Um, one of whom is our committee chair for Measure K who was so grateful to the community. We have been doing bike giveaway days and we are so excited. We have more than 30 families have requested bikes. It is truly a community effort to put all of these together. We have Ojai Presbyterian Church who delivered 20 new bikes, helmets and backpacks. Community members donated eight used bikes and Oakview Cyclery has been um, refurbishing them. They're amazing. They look like they're brand new. We still have Project Bicycle Loves bikes. And then we have some bike loves that were purchased by Family Fund. And next week, we will be handing out and delivering these 30 bikes to lucky students in the community who are in need of assistance with transportation. So we're excited for that just in time for the holidays. And then finally, our holiday tree, we have had 103 families who have requested assistance with our holiday family tree. And I wanna be, just share, you know, we talked about usually these programs are called adopt a family and we wanted to be really sensitive to the phrasing of that. And this is really just our way of supporting. We're not um, adopting a family, we're preserving dignity, we're giving them gift cards that they can use for whatever they deem best, not just for toys. So it might be a hot meal, it might be um, a gift for their children. It's um, open for them. And we have had almost $6,000 raised to date that we will divide between all of the families who qualify and have submitted their free and reduced lunch application. So we're really excited about that. That is a brand new initiative this year that's spearheaded by Morgan. And you heard about Morgan earlier at Minor Jokes, the office manager and Linda Jordan. 
have done a great job with that. Then just a couple of other updates for you. We have the Miners Oaks Library MOU was approved by the County Board of Supervisors. You approved that earlier in the year and uh, the County Board of Supervisors followed suit. So we are now preparing for what that will look like and meeting with the design team to start thinking about all the beautiful things we can do in that new library. And then finally this week we are piloting evening meal service pickup, which was a great idea by our own Chuck Crawford who said many families can't get to pick up meals during the day. So we're having evening pickup one, two days a week at Nordoff for families who might not be able to get to pick up meals during the day. And that is it for the superintendent's report. Thank you. I would actually, before we get further, I would like to, um, something last, in our last meeting, we had um, approved, or Tiffany had mentioned that she had had re her year, her mid-year review from the board. And during that, she presents the same as she does the superintendent report, some of the things that she has done and is particularly proud of this year. And Although it happened back in April, the board just learned that she had been nominated by assembly member Monique Lamone and our state Senator Hannah Beth Jackson for a woman of the year award back in April. And I'm sorry that that passed without us knowing it. So I just wanted to um, thank you for your hard work for us and uh, recognize that you had been recognized by Ventura County Assembly woman and our state senator, and to point out that although 76% of uh, educators are women, only 25% of leadership roles in education are held by women. So it's very important that we recognize you and um, hold you up to young children, young girls to recognize that they can also have positions of leadership and um, to um, be grateful that we have you on leading our staff. So thank you very much. It wasn't your fault you didn't recognize it. I didn't tell you. I didn't even tell my mother until um, recently. So. <laughs> Except that I get invited to that thing every year and I always go, it's down in Camarillo at some hotel. And I guess because of COVID they didn't have it. And so. I wasn't invited. <laughs> Thank you. We will now move into our presentations. The first one, 6.1, .1, is our return to campus update. Okay, so I'm going to go back to sharing my slide with you. One second. So this is the return to campus presentation that I gave to our students, which is why it's so colorful and outside of kind of our typical uh, <laughs> standard template I use in the board meetings. So I want to just share a little bit about the process. And this, this presentation is a little bit different. It's not all of the details that we would typically go through um, because it's more about the process and where we are in, in our thinking. As you know, right now, our elementary schools closed for just two weeks and we are planning on reopening as soon as possible. We will make sure um, that we're considering the numbers when we do so, but right now we're scheduled to return right after the holiday break. Our middle and high school campuses um, do not have, are not open for all students. There are some things still happening on their campus, but they're not broadly open. They are scheduled to return at the beginning of the second semester, which is in the middle of January, I think the 23rd, although I'm not sure. Dave, do you know, what, or Cheryl, what's the date of the start of second semester? Uh, January 25th. Oh, all right, it was pretty close, January 25th. However, we can't return to campus if we are not in the red tier for COVID monitoring for two weeks. So we have to also wait and see. However, we are preparing to return which takes a lot of time and effort, as you'll see in just a moment. So we've been meeting weekly, the middle and high school return to campus teams. We meet for about an hour and a half each group every week. And then this week, the elementary team also met sorry, last week to discuss light modifications to the hybrid schedule based on feedback. So 
we, you know, do the best we can to develop a plan. And then we want to make sure that we stop and assess how the plan is going. So in the elementary model, just a couple of little things that we think will help our TK through second grade students do a little bit better by um, making the optional, the afternoon Zoom um, optional and utilizing it a little bit differently. So we've received teacher feedback on the different schedule iterations. So that we take the work that we do in the committee and we take it back to teachers and say, what do you think? Um, Nordoff has done a really great job of this at several staff meetings of getting feedback um, led by the teacher team, which includes Kim Hoy and Bronwyn Cole Michaels. And last week we met, as you heard from the students, we met with the leadership and the um, student advisory committee students. And then tomorrow night, this will be presented to our parent advisory committee. So we're working on stakeholder feedback kind of midway through this process so that we can kind of gauge what's important and make sure that we're being responsive to the community. So this presentation, <coughs> excuse me, is really about priorities. And I just wanna share, we're committed to providing the best education experience possible through COVID. And one of the things that's really hard is there's no experience that we can provide that's perfect or even ideal or that's even normal. And so we know that there are always things that, um, that could be done better or would be different if we were in person. And we're doing the best we can in distance learning and in our hybrid model to make sure that we give the best possible experience, but sometimes there are things that we, we can't control. At the high school, we have two main limits, space and time. And so I'll talk to you a little bit. This is gonna be mostly about the high school, although the middle school has um, similar schedule and similar work that we're doing. So our major issue at the high school is the lack of space to socially distance. I've mentioned this before, many of our classrooms can only fit 12 students in a room when we have six feet apart. And so for this reason, if we were to come back at the high school, we would have to split each class into three groups potentially. And that, as you can imagine, makes the schedule much more complicated. At the middle school, luckily we have enough space. And so we can um, proceed with two groups at the middle school. So that makes it a little bit easier. So this is just a slide that Mr. Munson put together for our students illustrating that when we have the teacher at the front of the class, um, you know, these kids are kind of, and these desks are right against the wall. And then these kids over here are right against the wall. And then we have to have six feet from the teacher before the first row of desks starts. And so just really is, is limiting in that way. I also wanna um, share this again about quarantine issues. If we have a student in a pod who comes to school and later tests positive, those students become confirmed exposures. Um, right now we have two ABC pods that are quarantined and we have a classroom, an elementary classroom of students um, that would all be quarantined and we're not even um, in person right now. And so it is very difficult at the middle school and the high school to work through these quarantine issues if a student is a confirmed exposure or a positive and um, if other students start positive, start testing positive, very quickly, we have many students quarantined and our teachers, which becomes the other part that's problematic. We are doing everything we can to try and get additional substitutes. We are guaranteeing work. We um, will pay for the exam. There's some of the exam requirements have actually been waived at the state level. And still like everyone else in the state, we are struggling with having enough substitutes. I think Tiffany, I would just like to add in here if you could keep that uh, screen up. I have had a couple of questions from the public. Um, you know, again, why why can the elementary go back and not the middle school and high school? And that this this particular screen is talking about that when the elementary students go back, they are in one classroom with one teacher. At the middle school and the high school, they might be exposed to three different teachers and three different classrooms. So right. that, that is a different complication. Even this week, we would normally, if we had a confirmed positive, we would, um, and students are in pods, we would quarantine that one pod of students, but because the power was out, we had to combine pods and then we had to quarantine two separate pods of students. And so it, it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly in terms of contact tracing and quarantining while students are getting the test and 
um, yeah, particularly at the middle and high school, it, it gets much harder um, than it is at the elementary school where we just have pods of 12 kids. And if the power stays on, then we would just have a single pod and not have to combine them. And Tiffany, how many uh, substitutes do we currently have working I, in the district? Do you know? Answer to that. No, okay. not off the top. Sorry. Do you know, Cheryl? Oh, I don't know. I, I would uh, estimate maybe six to eight that are willing to come to the campus uh, and do in-person instruction. So I know that we tried to send, um, what was it, like seven teachers to a conference and we couldn't cover everybody's uh, substitute coverage to even go to the conference. So, And by send to a conference, we mean virtually have them attend <laughs> instead of being in class. So just to clarify, <laughs> they weren't going anywhere. <laughs> So, yeah, not very many that are willing to do in person. Have there, have there been any waivers of, you know, uh, some formal qualifications for teachers that maybe otherwise are great teachers, have maybe credentials from different states or have other backgrounds that would be really um, useful and make them um, good candidates? But you know, but otherwise might not meet some formalities. I feel like I've heard of some relaxation. Yeah, there is. There's the, um, right now the CBEST, which is the exam that you need to take is being waived because you can't take the CBEST because things are closed down. So um, there, there is that. Essentially you have to have a bachelor's degree really is the primary qualification. So and I think as you pointed out, though, the issue isn't just uh, are they qualified, but are they willing to do in-person <clears throat> teaching, which a lot of people are not going to take that risk for a substitute day. Mm -hmm. So in a single day, we have about six hours of instructional time. So give or take in that time, we have to accommodate students who will remain on distance learning. So we are committed in this district to um, providing a great education, even if students are not returning in person due to health or other concerns. We're not saying, well, you know, you 30% aren't coming back, so you're going to get a subpar experience. We're committed to providing the best experience for them, as well as the students who return in person. Uh, we still have to accommodate lunch. Our teachers are contractually required or entitled to a 45 minute duty free lunch. We have transition time. We have cleaning between pods. So if we had a, a pod of students come in, we wanna be able to clean the classroom before the next pod of students comes in. We have talked a lot with our teachers about student support time. And as Shelly mentioned, it might not be being utilized by all students, but our teachers feel like that time is really critical where they can say to specific students, we're gonna need you to come in during student support time. They can come in for tutoring. Um, they can work in small groups. And that time is really critical to making sure that students who maybe aren't thriving in distance learning or just didn't understand the, the assignment or the directions or the direct instruction have time to connect with their teacher because it's not like in a regular campus where you can just pop in at lunch or you can see your teacher in passing. It's just not possible. So um, we have three periods, as you know, and then this is an important component too that our high school is really taking into consideration is that we have a block schedule. And so we have an entire year of curriculum that we are trying to um, teach in one semester. And so we want to really try and to the degree possible, maximize the instructional time available. So all of those considerations, we, we take those and then we try and make the best schedule possible. And in that schedule, we have some trade-offs that we have been talking about as a team. And I wanna share those with you today and, and welcome your feedback about how you feel about these, these trade-offs. So um, the first trade-off that we've been talking a lot about is in-person time versus distance learning. And our teachers have decided that um, through many, many hours of discussion that we don't believe the best educational experience is to live stream instruction for in-person students. Um, that seems to be the most apparent solution for many districts is like, well, we'll just turn on the, we'll just live stream and then we'll have the kids at home and the kids at school get the same instruction during the time. And our teachers are, 
for the most part, adamant that when students are in front of them in person, they want to be doing small group work, they want to be doing labs, they want to be doing activities that don't lend themselves particularly well instructionally to just having a, a screen there. It's also quite difficult to manage students who are at home on Zoom and students who are in person, even if those in-person students are also in Zoom. Um, and at some point, as a student, if I'm going to come to school and I'm going to sit in a classroom on my laptop on Zoom, why would I, you know, come to school and not just do it at home in my jammies if I'm getting the exact same um, educational experience? And so we, this comes up and we have had days and days where we talk about this for hours and um, all three grade bands have decided that they do not believe it is the best instructional experience to live stream. So then we have to try and accommodate both in-person time and our distance learning time. And you know, teachers uh, are, can't do both effectively at once. And so here's just some examples of schedules and what we've been thinking about. And these aren't particular uh, schedules, they're just to show you in this first example, which is what we're doing right now with 80 minutes of distance learning for three periods at the high school, and then even shortening our student support period at the end of the day, we have 60 minutes. So if we were trying to do um, in-person instruction, we would either, if you wanted to see all three classes in a day, you would have a 20 minute class, which isn't very effective, or you might be able to see one class in a day, potentially, while still maintaining that 80 minutes of distance learning, which we think is a really um, good way of delivering direct instruction to both students in person at home, and then using that, um, the kids who come in person to do additional extension activities, essentially. Um, let's say that we shorten that distance learning time and we do um, 55 minutes. At the end of this day, we still have an hour and 45 minutes for in-person instruction, which ends up you know, not being a, a terribly long class. So what we've been trying to balance is how long do you need to come in person to make it worth your while? And then how many classes do you see? Keeping in mind that we still have that transition time between pods where we have to clean. And how do we, how do we make all of that work? So let's say that we flip it, like here in example three, and we have um, a 60 minute in-person and you go in-person, in-person, in-person. Now this doesn't account for transition time and um, cleaning, but let's say that we did this. Then you would have one hour and 30 minutes at the end of the day that would be available for distance learning and you would be trying to do three classes so you would have 30 minutes of direct instruction. And our teachers feel like if we're trying to accommodate the block schedule in an entire semester that 30 minutes of direct instruction isn't enough time. So this slide is just to show you that we're trying to balance really thoughtfully um, time in person and time on direct instruction, I mean time on distance learning and how we can accommodate all students while still providing that in-person experience. I'll pause if there are any questions so far. I'm just, this is, I'm just reacting. So uh, it's just my thought. Um, if I was a student and I had three classes, it seems like if we chose, let's say for instance, example one, my day would be normal, except I might get one of my classes in person. So it's possible that I might come to campus three times a week just for one class. Right. Because then we wouldn't have transition time. Like, well, so I guess what I'm saying is if I have, let's say my period one is gonna be in person, then I go home and I have period two and period three. But since I'm part of a pod, it's not like the entire period one students is there. So those that teacher still needs to teach two thirds of the class that's not there at some right. point in the day. Okay. Right. That what's, that's what makes this difficult is that you each class becomes three in-person classes. And I'll share, show you more about that in a moment. So essentially we need you know, nine slots for, for in-person. So let's go to, to trade-off two. And this is what we've been talking about is daily contact with teachers versus convenience for in-person classes. And this is something we really wanted our student feedback on. 
Um, our teachers feel like having daily contact and consistency is really important. So checking in every single day with your teacher on distance learning so that you have accountability, you can ask questions. Um, as much as we like to believe that we can just say to kids, okay, here's your assignment on Canvas, go do it and not check in with them at all. Many of them need that daily contact with their teacher to just ask questions for motivation, to for accountability, um, all of those things that we think are important but you'll see in the next slide that in-person or even just daily contact, even on distance learning with teachers, um, isn't, the most in, isn't the most convenient in terms of transportation and getting to in-person. So here's an example. Um, this is the most convenient model, we believe, for transportation and for students. <coughs> It's still not very convenient, but let's say that we had two days a week where we did um, just in-person and three days of um, distance learning. So if you were a group A person, you would go to period one, period two, and period three on Thursday. The rest of the time you would be doing asynchronous independent work. So you wouldn't see your teacher um, on Friday, and then you would go back to distance learning on Monday. We still can't really fit all of the um, group Bs into one day. We can't fit six blocks into a day effectively. Um, so one group would still have to be split over two days potentially. So this allows for transportation. It also has all these issues with cleaning between pods and lunch supervision potentially, which is also worrisome for us. And having kids on campus um, eating lunch when you would take your masks off, we feel like increases the risk. And then if it's raining, we are, you're gonna be inside with your masks off. And there's a lot of things that become problematic about serving lunch on campus. So another option is then to have kind of like I was showing in the first example, where you come for two periods a day in person. So maybe um, group A would come on Monday for two classes and then group, um, and then they would have a, a second or they would go to their third period on Tuesday and then group B would come. So it's not very easy because we have to have those three groups. Um, but this was the model that generally was most supported by the students. They liked this model the best. It also allows us to have that daily contact with distance learning with teachers every single day and that kind of consistency. Um, as you can see, the, the three groups are really problematic. At the middle school where we just have two groups, it's so much, it's so much easier. It's all those, all those um, options that come with the three groups. So pause if you have any feedback or thoughts. Um. Can I say something or is this like, okay. Yeah. Um, I remember also talking about with the students we were um, the schedule before, if it was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then like the two, um, like A would go one day, B would go one day and C would go one day. I know we kind of, or at least the students were kind of talking about that. Is that something that maybe could be an option or? Yeah, I mean, right now what we're really trying to do is think about conceptually what do we value and what we think that we value is daily contact for distance learning at the high school. And so how we fit in the rest of this um, and try and do so with um, consistency, it's just a little bit hard because those three classes, right, if we have, because you really go to three classes in person, so you would have... Um, we would spread this out so you would go maybe like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but then your your direct, uh, your distance learning direct instruction is much shorter if you're doing three in-person classes in a day, right? That really only leaves you two hours for distance learning at best. So, and if you split that between three classes, then we're getting pretty short periods. And remember, in a regular year, in a when you have a whole year to teach the curriculum, your periods are about 50 minutes. So if we have 50 minute periods and we're trying to do a whole year without a block period, that makes it kind of hard and we're worried about um, the impact of that. So, but yes, Ella, that's, that's a great point and something we'll 
bring back to the committee next time we meet, right? Um, let me go the right way here. So finally, our last trade-off, and this is something that we talked a lot about, and uh, to be perfectly honest, it doesn't feel very good to anyone on the, on the return to campus committee, is do we just limit the number of students who can come back in person? And other districts have done this. They've said, we have 24 in-person spots, sign up for them, and when they're full, they're full and then the rest of you will just stay on distance learning. Um, what makes that complicated is uh, that, you know, if you're going to three periods, maybe you get into, into one class in person, but another class you're on distance learning because you didn't make the cutoff, right? And so trying to balance those classes. Uh, and we are, our team feels like it's more important to us to allow students who want to come on campus the opportunity to do so by creating a schedule that allows them to do so. Um, if it happened to be that we had those three groups, A, B, C, and let's say we didn't have enough students coming back in person for the C group, maybe that C group is just an extra time in distance learning with those kids who didn't attend in person, if that makes sense. So um, we are not necessarily a fan of um, just closing off access, but we wanted to present it to you because that is one way that many districts have solved this, this complicated issue. Is there um, <clears throat> any, has any polling been done in terms of like a normal class, let's say there's 36 students in it, so you're thinking three groups. What if there are 12 students who would, would not return? Right, so we would probably put those in the C group, but we haven't pulled people right now because honestly, we're so far away that you might have a different opinion, right? I feel differently than I did two or three weeks ago now that the vaccine is rolling out um, and we're not talking about coming back till kind of the end of January, you might feel differently in three weeks or more than a month from now than you feel right now. So we have, not yet surveyed people, but that would be something we would do probably in the beginning of um, the beginning of January. We also really like the idea of teachers being able to create, and it's it's a logistical nightmare for Mr. Munson, um, but we like the idea of teachers being able to create groups that make sense. So maybe in math, I might have three different groups of students in math. So maybe my A group is, you know, one, one group of students who are working on something and my B group is another group of students. Um, or like in leadership, maybe you have your seniors come on, on in your A group and your sophomore juniors in your B group and your freshmen in your C group. Or in dance, you might do something similar. So we could, instead of just dividing by, by alphabet, we could divide students based on teacher selected groups or we could allow students to select people they would like to attend in person with. Again, a little bit of a logistical nightmare, but I have full confidence in the Nordoff administration to be able to pull that off. Um, but you know, if you said, I would like to have my in-person time with these you know, two people or three people, we really feel like for students who wanna come back, being with people that your friends is part of what part of the value, right, in that social emotional health that we're, we're worried about is if you are in a groups that don't have any of your friends, why would you want to come back in person necessarily? So we want to be able to potentially consider if we could group students or have them select, you know, these are three people I'd like to, and we would do the best we can to try and accommodate that. Yeah. Also I helps with- saying um, about the the students who might not choose to come back because they find the distance learning works better for them and they're uncomfortable coming is that you might end up with just two groups instead of three groups. Right. I think that would be true for some classes, but not all classes, if that makes sense, right? Because students don't move through in a, in a set cohort in period one, maybe I have fewer students who come back and then period two, it just happens to be that those classes have everyone coming back. And the other thing I'd like to add is that, uh, you know, Jane, we, we did wrestle with that question about when would be the right time to poll, um, but we felt like until we had um, something a bit more substantial in terms of a plan to offer, 
we didn't feel like people would be able to make a decision unless they had a better idea of what it was they were choosing to come back to or not. I would like to hear um, the students and maybe Emma, it was you that had mentioned, you guys were, you had a discussion on Sunday about the, the feeling of distance learning versus a hybrid in-person learning. Can, can you share that? Yeah, um, what we discussed is that some people find distance learning to be very beneficial while other people um, aren't finding it as beneficial and they prefer the in-person learning. So it again, it really is a split. And I think a lot of people on the Student Advisory Council found that distance learning was pretty beneficial for them. But again, that's not really catering to other students' needs. Also, I just like quickly want to point out that a lot of the split was between not that the classes weren't necessarily efficient because teachers have found ways to make the class like a really good learning experience. It was more of like self-motivation. Um, a lot of things that were coming up was like kids just like not able to focus. Um, and that was causing the distraction and making it harder in distance learning, not necessarily like the teaching <clears throat> way the curriculum was getting out to the kids. And I think one of you too mentioned that some of the teachers are using um, video, which the students really liked because they could go back to it. Whereas if they're in-person learning or if they're on Zoom for a live feed and they um, maybe their internet cuts out for a second or there's a little bit of a lag or they're writing and they miss what the teacher said, they're, they're losing that, but they're finding the teachers who are using some video for the lecture part it's actually beneficial to them because they can go back and re-listen. We actually know from um, John Hattie, who's a researcher, that the most impactful thing we can do in distance learning in terms of statistically impactful for students is the use of videos. And so we've been encouraging our teachers to do so. They all have different degrees of comfort with that. If we um, had to do this another year, I think we would be in a, in a different place and maybe able to do that. but. Some teachers are really comfortable doing that. Uh, you know, Jake Hansen, our video teacher, for example, obviously uses a lot of video. Some of our other teachers are still, um, you know, new and, and learning how to do that, so. Yes, and making those videos takes a lot longer than you might imagine. <laughs> I don't know if Angie's on right now, but she has many stories about uh, at the beginning trying to figure out how to do videos in her classroom and uh, many, <laughs> many examples of filming many, 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 many times. <laughs> many examples of doing a 20 minute video only to realize that you just clicked on the X and you didn't save it. So that, yeah. <laughs> But we know it's impactful for our students and when we can, we definitely um, support that across the board. Also, if it makes it easier for the teachers, um, like those kinds of videos, lecture videos where we can go back um, is really helpful, but also just videos that they find like on YouTube that are supplemental are also really helpful. So I don't know if that helps, but. <laughs> I would add that I think the, the pulling is, essential because it could really impact how you decide to develop your schedule. And I know it's a bit of the chicken or the egg, right? If we don't have enough information to give our families, they won't be able to make a good decision like Dave was saying. Um, but at the same time, if you have people who are just no matter what, we're not coming back this year, then that would take a good chunk of your population to keep them on distance learning, which could impact the number of groups that you have. Our, our current plan is right after we return from um, the holiday break to, to roll that survey out to families with some, some options. And then we would have, you know, we would at least be within the same month. And so you might be able to make a better decision knowing where our numbers are and kind of how you're feeling about returning. Um, we, we have this timing here in Ojai where we like, we're going to open and we're going to have summer school. And then the numbers rise every time we say that we're going to do that. And so um, we're trying to, you know, 
be a little bit closer to the actual time so we don't have such a disparity between what we think we're going to do and what ends up happening due to things beyond our control. I, I concur with that as a parent. Um, if you asked me right now, I, I'd be hard pressed to tell you which way we were going to go. Um, knowing that Ventura County just came out with 1% today on our, our ICU capacity, uh, that gives me great pause. So um, I think we would, you know, speaking from my own experience, have a, a more accurate accounting from parents after the holiday. That was the end of my slides. We do have a couple of public comments on this if there are no other, if there are no other comments or feedback from the board. I just wanna basically share with you and with our community the, the work that we're doing and thinking about and how kind of complicated it is and all the factors that we have to take into consideration to try and really do what's, what works best we think for our teachers, our community and our students. I would just like to add that um, I, you know, I may appreciate all the work and I understand the difficulties, but I know personally as a board member, I really, I'm really hoping for something different second semester that we can get some kind of in-person learning for all students. And that's our goal. We're planning for this with the, the assumption that it will happen as soon as we can come back in the second semester. So we, we are gearing up for this. There's no option on the table right now to just continue with straight distance learning for the rest of the year. We don't have that scheduled for consideration, so. I love that the students are involved in the decision-making process. I give you good kudos for having everybody's voice be heard through this process. So the next steps for us here are to, um, as I mentioned, continue to work on these schedules, refine them, continue with our feedback, presenting the same presentation tomorrow to the Parent Advisory Committee, really getting feedback around how do people feel about those different trade-offs. Um, I didn't hear from the board if you had a decision one way or another about if you wanted to limit access to students or you know, to like 24, or if you wanted it to be available for everyone who wanted to come back in person. Did you have a, any takes on that personally? I have a question. How would those um, allowed to come in in person be selected? Would it be based on the, the most detrimental impact to not being there or by lottery or how would that happen? There's a few different models. Uh, I think some districts have gone to the lottery model and some have been in the first come first serve model. Like if you sign up and you get a slot, you get a slot. And if you don't, you don't. Um, I don't know that there's a good model that doesn't create some kind of animosity and upsetness around people who, who don't get selected if they wanted to get selected. I mean, this might be too complicated, but is there any way if we go that way, say say a lottery, but it's a lottery for every class and you guarantee that each student has at least one in person or two instead of you don't get all three, but you, you'll have two classes. So you, if you if like we do a lottery for period one, you, you those students that won the lottery get set aside, they're not entered in the lottery for period two until all students have, have an in-person class. And then, I mean, I know it's very complicated, but I'm just saying it's a, it's a thought to make sure, you know, if what would the numbers look like if every student had two in-person classes, but they had one class that was, I'm gonna be thane and argue against myself here. And now I think that would not work well for something like dance or band or, science labs. <clears throat> yeah. I, I'm not, right now, if you ask me, I'm not in favor of, um, of guaranteeing it for some and, and not for all. I think um, 
what comes to mind for me is, is we have been battling depression issues and, and mental wellness issues with our students. And if you allow some to have that social interaction, the isolation for those who can't be involved just seems that much greater. And I would be concerned about that um, for our mental health of our students. I, I'm concerned that we didn't hear public comment also. And it seems there were public comments on this topic. There are, I'm just gonna read them. We'll definitely read them. Yeah. Just if Kevin or- Yeah, I, I, just briefly, I, I think I probably uh, agree with Shelly. Um, you know, I, I, think, um, I think it's hard to imagine um, allocating scarce in-person resources on a, certainly if you're going to do it on a, you know, kind of on a limited basis, I would certainly say a lottery over first come first serve. I think first come first serve is one of the most, you know, always inherently unfair. Some people learn about it, some don't, you know, somebody gets tipped off a little early. Um, so I would say lottery for sure. But I think I agree with she Shelly that I do think there's a, there's a risk, um, which I, you know, I generally, like to think that we would provide as much as we can to those we can and, and, you know, live with the consequences. But I think in a situation like this, um, the, the pop, the fact that some would be able and others who want to would not, would be, would, would not be a good dynamic. So I would say I would want whatever the solution was to be one where we would accommodate everyone who wanted to be in person up to whatever the level was we could we could we could accommodate. I would also agree with Shelly and with Kevin <clears throat> that I think that we're gonna, like you said, you mentioned as well, Dr. Morris, that we're gonna create um, animosity. And to me, if we were forced into a situation like that, I think it would need to be done on teacher recommendation for need, um, not, not just randomly, because there are certain students who are really struggling um, and need additional resources, but I would prefer that we gave the same option to all kids who want to come back if we can. I, I I actually thought also of the idea of need. I, my my thought though is that that might concentrate kids all, you know, with the 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 neediest kids all in the classrooms, and that might itself create a problematic learning environment for the kids that are there. You know, that it's not a diverse environment, but instead a environment an environment of kids that are all at that moment really struggling, and that might that itself might might almost exacerbate those those problems. So I, but I, you know, it's pure speculation from a non-educator. I, I understand what you're saying, but I, I think what I have seen in these um, smaller class sizes is the ability for teachers to give direct attention and focus on so few kids, having a third of your kids in your class versus, you know, 36 versus 12, it's, amazing the amount of time they have to focus and spend on on students and really be able to give them guidance and help you know um that's what i've been witnessing lately okay i think i will um take this moment to read our public comments um for um, from Kathleen Rooney, I would like to address uh, Kathy. I guess if you could set a timer, I, I think these are both short, but just in case, a three-minute timer. I would like to address the decision to close in-person instruction and return to full distance learning. My son is a fourth grade student who has been thriving with the in-person instruction. When behind a screen, he feels disconnected and it is hard for him to feel engaged. When he found out that school was closing again, he stated, I feel very, 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 very sad. Ever since school has closed for the second time, he has asked me every single day when we think school will reopen. I honestly wish I could tell him tomorrow. However, I feel the decision to close the schools was made without comment or input from the Ojai community. 
Ojai's COVID positivity rate is less than 1%. And between the stringent mask and six foot rule, the possibility of transmitting COVID-19 is super slim. The social emotional health of these students is imperative. And I feel was disregarded in the decision in particular, considering the positivity rate so low here. I implore you to reconsider the needs of the students when it comes to the possibility of reopening in early January. Our students need their teachers and peers in order to progress both social, emotionally, and for some students like my son, academically. Um, I just, a uh, response to that is that we closed for two weeks. So as we stand right now, we will be reopening on January 4th. And those two weeks were concerns about the high rates after uh, Thanksgiving, which we did find we have um, students and staff who are either have tested positive or who are quarantining because of exposure. And I don't believe we would have been able to actually staff the classrooms if we had kept them open for the last two weeks. A public comment from Suzanne Soule. I am the mom of a fourth grader at Topa. I am deeply disappointed in your rushed decision to close the school. We had no chance to comment, no opportunity to participate, and no time to plan. The data are clear that young students need to be in the classroom. Why don't you make that your mission? You are widening the gap between private school students and public school students who are in live classrooms. You should see Topa students sit by themselves trying to concentrate on Zoom. Come on, we can test ourselves weekly if necessary. Your mission is to provide a quality education to the remaining students in Ohio's public schools. Do you want public schools to be a real option for working parents? Please get it together and reopen. Any other um, discussion on the return to campus item? I thought you had another public comment. You had mentioned Jim earlier. Yeah, so it's actually not up on the public comment form. So I'm assuming it's it's just a private letter. Okay. Um, also, it's over 400 words. So that's, I don't know, maybe that's why he chose not to do the public comment form, but <clears throat> I'm gonna assume it's private. Um, 6.2, though I will, maybe I can just say that um, he's also very supportive of being in person and very disappointed in the quick decision um, and feeling that we're not looking at the Ojai numbers. We're, whoops, I'm on the wrong page here. Um, our next item. Jane, a public comment that came after the deadline for this that um, was emailed to all board members, so. Will those be able to be added on to the meeting minutes yes. on the public? So when you click on this agenda a week from now, you'll see those comments. 6.2 is our school spotlight for Nordoff High School. Mr. I'd like to introduce Dave Munson, who has spent a lot of time working over the weekend on this, <laughs> this slideshow we were working on. Um, we're very excited. This is part of our school spotlight that we have now at every meeting and we wanted to particularly have this one tonight because it ties in with the the return to campus idea and since uh, Nordoff has been coming up a lot in that regards we wanted to make sure that we were able to spotlight what else is happening at Nordoff. And Dave I am going to share my screen with you or I'm going to run the powerpoint with you for you sorry. Uh -huh. Give me one second and you'll just tell me when you want me to go to the next slide, all right? Okay, all right, got myself off mute and I wanna thank you for having me tonight. Um, you know, I wanna start off by saying that uh, despite the pandemic and school closures, um, the Nordoff teachers, the staff, um, and the students and parents have shown some great resilience. And I'll say yes, there is always room for improvement. Um, in anything that we do, uh, particularly now though, during um, our pandemic. But I hope this following presentation uh, will show that we are doing good work given our circumstances and limitations. <clears throat> so I want you to go ahead to the first slide there and start off by saying that as of December 14th, uh, right now we have 748 students enrolled and um, 
I was hard pressed to find uh, m many years back uh, when we were at that many students at this point in the school year. And just to give you a snapshot of the last three years, here's where our numbers were um, as of December 14th uh, during these last three school years. So uh, I'm happy to say that we are up in enrollment and we have had um, probably an equal number of students come to us uh, from public schools as well as private schools. And you know, hearing from some of our parents that have come to us from private schools, they have been real pleased with the job that we've been doing on distance learning. So um, I think th these numbers are, are, are a testament to the good work that we're doing here. We have some new programs, uh, some that are just in their second year, and I wanted to highlight that. Uh, the Greater Good Leadership Program is uh, a public-private school partnership that we have with the Thatcher School. And this program has really taken off. And in fact, uh, expect to hear more from it. I just want to give you just a little glimpse, a, a preview that uh, we regularly invite uh, guest speakers to come. And recently we had a Nordoff uh, grad, Ben Vale, uh, talk to the class. And his story was so inspiring to students that a, a couple students from that program have decided to create their own um, uh, character uh, hall of fame for alumni uh, who have gone on to do great things after they've graduated for Nordoff. So um, that's just a little preview of what's in the works uh, just based on that one particular class. Uh, we added eSports this year. It's a, it's a club, but it is sponsored by the uh, CIF. It, it's not uh, an official CIF sport, uh, but they are promoting it because you may not know this, but uh, there are many universities around the country that offer uh, full ride scholarships to participate on their esports team. And what we felt like this uh, actually grasp uh, uh, part of our demographic, our student pop, excuse me, our student population um, that you know really um, regular sports or other curricular activities had an appeal to, and um, we're really happy about the potential of this program. Uh, hey, can you tell us what esports is? I had to look it up when I first heard it. I didn't know what it was. Well, it's electronic sports, so that's where the E comes in. But it's essentially online gaming where you are on teams competing against other teams. Um, what, one of the big games is uh, Fortnite. Um, so if you've heard of that game, it's essentially you, you've got a team of five or six players that are going up against another team. Uh, being an old dog, I, I create the analogy of like, it's like electronic capture the flag. So if that resonates with anybody, um, yeah, anybody in my age group. Uh, so that club has um, also come out of our career technical education pathway where these students aren't just uh, playing online games, but in fact, uh, this team came together to actually build the uh, gaming computers. So that's where they started with is getting and purchasing all of the necessary components to build uh, a, a gaming system that had um, the capabilities to be able to uh, online game. And, and don't ask me what those capabilities are. I'm not the right person to answer that. Um, but, you know, they have to have a well, anyway, I'm not even going to try. Uh, but Jay Canton's been fantastic in, in not only overseeing the program, but getting the kids together uh, to help build those computers. So it's, it's more than just gaming. They're, they're doing some hands-on uh, projects. Uh, girls Lacrosse, uh, you know, we brought this in last year uh, as an option uh, in our spring sports. Unfortunately, I think we only had about three or four games under our belt before our spring sports season was uh, canceled, uh, but we hope that it will start up again in the spring and that we can get girls across a, a full season or even a, a little longer season. And then um, with the introduction of Edgenuity classes uh, this year in the breadth that we've offered it, you know, our students have access to other um, classes that they haven't had access to before um, through Nordoff High School. Um, obviously, students could take these at other places, uh, whether it's colleges um, or other online programs, but this is the first time uh, that they've had this opportunity through our program uh, with Edgenuity. 
uh, academic data. This is something that we're really proud of because I'm sure you've heard a lot of uh, stories about students that have been failing at uh, astronomical rates, uh, lots of concerns about uh, achievement gaps. Uh, but I'm happy to say that, you know, we've had a real strong focus on academics coming out of the gate. And uh, I'm happy to say that when you look at these numbers, uh, almost two thirds of our students uh, earned at least a 3.0 GPA or better. And, and, and of that group, 35% earned a 4.0 GPA or greater. And so um, that's an impressive number that I think uh, is a testament to uh, our students, you know, for their ability to stick with it, um, but also our teachers um, for uh, pivoting quickly and, you know, learning several things, you know, transitioning to a block schedule, uh, mastering Zoom, uh, figuring out how to uh, build a canvas shell, and all the while keeping the focus on, uh, you know, the academic rigor that we have. And, and you've heard it from some of our student representatives that they feel that it's gone much better in the fall than it has in the spring. And that's why we have this split, because I think we are doing a good job on distance learning. Thank you, Dave. I would like to, because we did have um, parents have commented, you know, that they don't, they're not sure how this is something that we can like sort of say is a, is it praising because, you know, I guess their assumption is that teachers are grading differently, but I, I believe that what I've been hearing from students and from teachers is that is not the case that this change to the block schedule has allowed um, the opportunities for deeper learning and we are grading the same way we were grading a year ago. Is that right? Uh, similar. Yes, not entirely, but, um, you know, that's been the silver lining that we also try to focus on with, uh, our pandemic, uh, is it being forced to have to experiment with new ways of doing things. And, and one thing that I found is that teachers uh, have allowed, you know, students to uh, turn in assignments much, much later than they used to. Uh, they're also providing more opportunities for students to improve on any work that had been submitted and graded uh, in order to improve that. So there's been some changes in, in that grading aspect of it. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, we've gone back to, um, you know, our rigorous grading policy that we've had um, prior to the pandemic. And I think the students have risen to the occasion. And you'll see on this next slide here, you know, we weren't, um, you know, killing it right out of the gate. You know, it was, it was a hard transition for quite some, uh, quite a few of our kids. But, uh, you know, thanks in part to that student support period and, and really the effort to um, focus on these students that uh, we noticed were not engaging the way that they used to. Um, and, you know, our administrators, you know, I'll give credit to Jim Hall and Jamie Rooney. They uh, showed up at um, students' doorsteps to check in on them, to provide um, Chromebooks, to provide hotspots, uh, to actually take some hard copy uh, classroom materials to them. So, you know, they have not just limited themselves to emails and phone calls. They've gone out there to try and make contact with these students. And um, our teachers at the same time have also encouraged kids to come to office hours. You know, we've gotten kids uh, hooked up with peer tutoring. And so we've really tried to uh, do something different than what we were seeing around the country, which is uh, limit, you know, kids that are getting D's and F's. Uh, we just recently received um, our 1920 data uh, on our graduation rate, and and we did take a bit of a dip. And this, uh, you know, it's it, it's not something that we're proud of, but you know, it's not completely unexpected. We lost a few more kids in springtime than we normally have, uh, but I'm still fairly pleased that you know we're in the 90 percent. And when you compare us against uh, other uh, Ventura County districts and schools in the state of California, uh, that we, we hold our own against them. This data was just released on Friday, by the way. So you'll be seeing some analysis of this coming out soon. But this is, this is the first, first time it's been public for you. 
And the next one is our A to G rate. And um, the A to G rate is, is the percentage of students who have completed all of the necessary requirements to enter a four-year state university or the University of California system uh, as a freshman. So, and they have to pass uh, these predetermined classes with C's or better. And so this is the three-year data, uh, again, with the most recent data that's come out. And, and you can see a very consistent trend, not only for Nordoff High School, but um, uh, Ventura County and the state of California. Um, we, we would like to increase those numbers though. And so one area that we're looking at is these non A to G classes. We have 10 of them that working with uh, the Ventura County Office of Education, uh, there are classes, uh, in fact, uh, you know, Tiffany shared with me that prior to becoming superintendent here, she worked for the, uh, I believe it was the Career Education Center in Camarillo. And their job was to get, you know, auto welding, uh, uh, leadership classes, you know, some of your perhaps non-traditional AG classes to get them A to G approved uh, to capture again another slice of our student population uh, to provide them an opportunity whether they choose to or not but provide them that opportunity to be A to G eligible uh, and, and thus access to a four-year university uh, right after high school. Can I pause and just ask um, actually Rebecca was instrumental in this Rebecca, are there any of these classes that we know can't be A to G approved? The CTE classes? Just in general. I mean, I know we can do auto and I, have we been able to get health A to G approved or is health always not A to G? I think health is not, is not an A to G approvable. At least I haven't seen it approved, but um, the rest of them, I believe you can. I think so too. I happen to know somebody who um, has an A to G approved jazz and marching band course that we may be able to take a look at. <laughs> so that's one of our areas that we're going to try and ask in that is, is health required by the state of California. So maybe our curriculum committee in the, in the future looks at something to replace that, especially as we, as we hope to get to ethnic studies at some point. The graduation requirement for OHI? Yeah. It's a graduation required, but I'm not sure it's an A to G requirement. I mean, um, a state requirement. requirement. A state requirement. Thank you. I think lots of districts have moved to either integrating health, the, the required health components into other classes um, so that it's not a standalone class. Um, kind of like they've done with geography, right? So geography used to be a standalone class and now we integrate that in a lot of ways, not in our district, but other districts integrate that in other, other ways. So it's possible to do that with health, I think as well. Um, as mentioned uh, previously, we, we are concerned about our students' uh, mental health and, you know, thankfully, uh, Janine Murphy has got a great group of interns that have appointments available. Um, our own academic counselors um, also are available for uh, mental health conferences. Uh, we also have peer tutoring for the academic student support along with office hours. So students have a choice, you know, if they prefer to try and work with uh, another student, uh, we have a great group of peer tutors set up. Uh, but if they prefer to work with a teacher, uh, teachers have office hours available. But, you know, we're experiencing, you know, what others are in the difficulty in engaging students just beyond that 80 minute block period, getting them to come back after hours. Um, and especially for those that need it the most, it's, it's far more difficult in a virtual atmosphere rather than in person where we could actually just go speak with them in person or, in fact, um, actually go and pick them up and take them. Uh, to an office hour where they meet with the teachers. Uh, but this last bullet point, that dedicated student support period, I, I feel like that has uh, really been instrumental in, in helping, you know, not only keep students engaged, but also help the academic component of it. Um, but we've had uh, a few teachers report that they've had some really nice conversations with students just about life in general, you know, even though that wasn't the intention of the phone call, 
um, it, it really just highlighted for them, you know, that uh, human to human interaction. And when they get that some time with them, uh, just how valuable it is to students. So, you know, kind of going back to uh, Jane, I think it was your point about uh, returning students to campus. Um, you know, essentially our, our, our teachers understand that. They understand that they want to meet with kids. Um, it's just entirely difficult for this, uh, you know, to happen um, in the way that is going to meet everyone's need. Okay, next slide. Um, our ASB leadership has uh, tried to keep students engaged. Uh, Rama and Cole Michaels, uh, you know, she's been very active in sending out uh, activities for people to do. We just recently did a door decorating contest, uh, but all the way through Halloween, um, you know, we've had our heritage months. Uh, she does a weekly virtual scavenger hunt, uh, trivia, highlights pets of the week. Uh, we all wear our Friday uh, NHS quarantine t-shirts. And, and, and what's kind of neat to see is uh, when I go through town, students wearing those out, uh, out and about. And then just last Friday, we uh, did our first senior class photo in the stadium. And um, we had a couple bumps to it, but uh, I think we've worked out the kinks. But it was really just nice seeing the kids in person. And I think for the kids, it was uh, just very helpful for them to see their friends. There was a a sense of normality. Uh, the, the pomp and circumstance hum started as they were in the stadium thinking about what June might look like for them. Um, so all in all, regardless of whether the photo turns out well, I think it was a good experience for them. Uh, what's new and interesting, uh, you know, despite the fact that we have not been able to bring college reps on campus, uh, Sarah Escobar, uh, along with our counselors have just been great in setting up workshops and, and, and rep visits. Uh, the counseling department created this uh, amazing 75 plus slide presentation that talks about college and career readiness. Uh, in fact, as a parent uh, that has gone through the college application process, I found myself referencing that on a few occasions uh, to try and get a sense of the differences between the UC application, the CSU application, and then the community college application. So having that was a great resource. And talking about what the kids did, uh, it, it's great to have that to go back and reference, you know, as they talked about teachers creating videos that they could go back and review. Um, this has been really fantastic. And I believe, uh, we, Dave, we also translated that into Spanish. Yes, we did. Absolutely. Right. All the whole thing. Yep. Uh, we did a random acts of kindness challenge and uh, the Hills, uh, the juniors and uh, freshmen, uh, they've been doing some <laughs> volunteer work. Um, and Rebecca Kirkland, you might have seen in the Ohio Valley News that uh, she organized uh, students to write letters to folks in the uh, Artesian um, senior home. Um, as I just touched on earlier, the Greater Good Leadership program was connecting alumni with current students, but our dance program did that recently, brought back uh, some dance alum to talk with the current students. And, and, and again, just a really nice uh, way of bringing our former students, uh, pairing them up with our current students. And then the big thing is, uh, as a faculty, we are working on um, PLCs. They stand for Professional Learning Communities. And the, the statistics and the data coming out of PLCs uh, really is encouraging. It, it's, not, it's not a program, it's a process for how teachers work. And so it, it's a bit of a slow build, but we feel the schools that have transitioned to doing PLC work have seen some great improvements in their um, academic data and their student engagement data. So um, we are working on that um, at the high school level. And that's our presentation for tonight. I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. I don't have a question, but I would say that I'm so proud of the great, the great academic progress you guys are making during these trying times. And it's a testament to your leadership, Mr. Munson, and Thank you. to the faculty and staff that's making all this happen during these terribly difficult times. So they should be incredibly proud of themselves for the progress. Thank you. I'll make sure that they know that.
And I appreciate your comment at the beginning that knowing that these are wonderful accomplishments and, and we're still going, we're still working on that hill and still, you know, we recognize we're not answering all people's needs and we're, we are still, um, still trying to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. We had some great momentum going last year, you know, with our curriculum council. Um, you know, when we're talking about ethnic studies, we talk about women's studies. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we want to do. Uh, even just that PLC work, we had some fantastic uh, momentum going. Um, but, you know, again, a testament to the, the professionalism that I have on the faculty and the staff, you know, they've been all in. I mean, they, they have, th this has been the hardest work for educators uh, in any of the years that we've been here. Um, you know, many of them gave up their summers. Uh, most of them, if not all of them, give up uh, hours on their weekend. Uh, they're working, you know, anywhere from two to three hours more per day. Uh, they really want to see the kids, uh, but they also want to do right by the kids and make sure they have a great academic experience because, you know, we know that uh, you know, our seniors going to move on. They're going to be college freshmen next year. So, you know, we don't want to short them. So we are really trying to do our best to adapt to this new environment. And, um, you know, while the teachers may have a preference, you know, they are committed to the students. So they're going to do, you know, whatever they have to do that we feel is in the best interest of our students. I would just like to say to that point, uh, Mr. Munson, how much time did you take off over the summer? Um, I think I got seven days in. Yeah. So instead of the summer off. So um, for all of those things that he just said about how hard the teachers are working, it wouldn't happen. Literally all the scheduling, all the uh, all the things that he's talking about, I know weigh heavy on you and you work really hard all summer to make sure that we could um, pull off the schedule that we have. And I think all those D's and F rates um, that are are not skyrocketing are due to the work that you've done with your team, specifically identifying some students to work with who you feel like haven't been successful, reaching out to them, not just home visits, but in, in person and working with their families. So I appreciate I, the team. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, and I'll say that I could not ask my teachers to work that hard if I wasn't willing to lead by example. And um, again, you know, we're not completely satisfied. I mean, we, we, we don't like to, you know, see that chunk of kids who are getting D's and F's, so we're gonna keep working at it. But I also think that there's great things that are coming out of this that I think when we get on the, you know, the back end of this, I, I think Nordoff is going to be uh, poised and in position to, you know, really make some gains in the coming years. I just wanna throw out that, um, you know, one of the, the sort of silver linings of, of, the, uh, of COVID has been um, my opportunity as a parent to sit in by accident on some of my kids' classes. For example, Ella has often been going early morning, seven o'clock to Santa Barbara for volleyball. And on her way back, I get to listen to her um, history lecture from Mr. Buck. And it's, you know, I, I've been really impressed um, with, with, you know, and uh, Mr. Jackson for math. Uh, and I know we could all of us have our own individual experiences with many of the great teachers over there, but it's pretty neat. You know, I mean, um, I, I, I felt really impressed with the, um, frankly, just the, the degree of, um, uh, you know, interesting material they're able to weave into what could otherwise be pretty boring stuff. And I think some of that is intentional as a result of COVID, you know, realizing that you have to kind of keep it a little punchier maybe than usual. usual. And I think it, at least for, you know, some of the stuff I've seen, it, it's been really great. Well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. I, I appreciate all of your positive comments towards our teachers because it, it really matters to them. It makes a difference. You know, when they hear, hear those comments from you, when you guys comment, you know, on their academic success, um, you know, that, that means a lot to them because this is, you know, this isn't just a job to them, you know, this, you know, for most of these teachers, it's a calling and, and Kevin, like you say, you know, that they have, they know they've had to up their game and it's, it's been in a new environment that for some of them, it's, you know, as hard as they're trying, it, it's also stressful and, and it's been, you know, anxious for them, you know, if they haven't been familiar with technology and doing as much work on the computers uh, in the past, it was a really hard transition for them, but, 
you know, again, th they're professionals and they're dedicated to the school, they're dedicated to the students and they're dedicated to the district. So, you know, when you guys say those things, uh, believe me, it matters. Thank you, Dave. And, and I will join in my colleagues in, in giving kudos. Um, I too have been impressed with the creativity because I really didn't know how some of these classes would work in distance learning. Not all of them translate so easily as, as uh, you know, they're not lecture classes. They, they, it's, it's tough and it takes very um, nimble, creative minds to figure out how to, to make this work. And so I'm appreciative. And I'm really um, also very happy to hear about um, Jamie Rooney and Jim Hall reaching out and, and going to people's houses and, and making sure that, that our students aren't falling through the cracks. That's really important to me to hear. So I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you. You're welcome. So I, I'm just gonna say what everybody else said and you guys are just doing great stuff. Keep doing it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. I think we'll move on to 6.3. Um, Ella and Emma, this has turned out to be a bit longer evening. So if you need to say goodbye, you're welcome to. If you'd like to stay for the one more item, um, whatever works for you. Is, is there anything, did you want to speak quickly or do you want to watch or how are you guys feeling? <clears throat> um, for me on this specific topic, I'm not sure if there's too much to add to it. Um, what about you, Emma? Yeah, I agree with you. Okay. So if you, you guys can say goodnight and then you can watch this on the weekend if you if you if you're interested in the topic. Sounds good. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for being here so late. All right. So I am going to give an update on our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And just like Dave said, uh, we have a lot of work to do here and we're not done. We're not satisfied with where we are. We are working every day in, in this realm. Um, in every decision that we make, we really try hard to think about it from these lenses. Um, but I, I want to say, I know that we're not perfect and that we, we still have a long ways to go. But I'm excited to share with you where we are. This is our goal, kind of our mission statement that was developed by the Guiding Coalition. If you remember, we have four Guiding Coalitions uh, around our district values. We have one that's on diversity, equity, and inclusion. It used to be called the Inclusion Group, but we broadened it. So this is the mission statement that the group came up with. It seems like a lifetime ago, but I think it was just last school year. And then I added this quote because we had a meeting, a subcommittee meeting this week and Dolores Johnson, who you may know works in our technology department, as we were talking about revisiting this mission statement, she said, we just wanna look at the child as an absolute part of this family. And I thought that was a really succinct way of putting what we are, are trying to do. And so I just wanted to honor Dolores for her fun contribution there uh, that was very meaningful to me. So looking at this work, there are several categories. This is such a broad topic, which makes it sometimes a little bit unmanageable. Our guiding coalition is doing great work. Uh, it is organic and sometimes it feels like we're making a lot of progress and sometimes it feels like it, we're a little stuck. Um, and partially it's because we're trying to address all of this stuff um, in you know an hour a week in different subcommittees. And so it, it's, you know, it's hard and it's, it takes a long time, um, but we are working in all these areas and I'm just gonna give you some updates and then where we're going in each area. So in terms of equity driven student support, we really are trying to focus on our most vulnerable students. So in every grade band, we spend a lot of time looking at who are students who are not being successful. Uh, I get this question on occasion, how many students do we have that are just not checking in at all, that are just missing like we had in the spring? And um, right now it's none. We have some students who have attendance issues and we're supporting them, but we don't have any students where we just don't know and they just never log on. Um, we have a lot of support built into our schedule for students with Ds and Fs. So that student support period is actually pretty unique. In talking to other superintendents, they did not originally build that in. 
And I think it's been, as Mr. Munson, Munson just pointed out, it's been a huge success and our elementary teachers, our middle school and our high school teachers in revisiting the schedule are all committed to keeping that time because it's how we really provide that time um, to serve our most vulnerable students who, who need the most help and most one-on-one -on -one help who might not be able to get it in distance learning or in person, just have that, that specific teacher support. Uh, we just did a training. Uh, Linda Jordan, who is our new homeless and foster youth coordinator, did a training on support for homeless and foster youth. Uh, we should be doing that annually and we have not always done it. So we're working on providing training so that our teachers know how to identify students who might be homeless and have some ways that we can specifically support those students. Tiffany, does that mean that Linda Jordan went to a training or she trained staff? She, she has been going to faculty meetings and giving a presentation on, on this topic and how we can support students. So kind of raising that awareness. And then we have some additional training with teachers that we will need to do in the future. <clears throat> But she has also been to lots of trainings, <laughs> Linda herself. <laughs> and there's a lot to learn in this area. Um, so looking forward, we it, you have a board goal that is around an equity review of achievement and opportunity gaps for student subgroups. And we've been working on some other um, districts that have done some of that work. So we've been looking at different frameworks, different platforms that we can use to start doing that equity review. And we're looking forward to making sure that we at least know if there are opportunity gaps and then start working to try and address those. Next, we have social emotional health. And, you know, I would say in a lot of the comments from parents, there's this sense that um, we don't care about student social emotional health. And I would say nothing is further from the truth. It's just really difficult to try and balance um, this with everything else. And so we have tried really hard, even from like the first day when we shut down in March. If you remember way back in March, we shut down on March 13th. And the next week before we had curriculum out, we had social emotional health supports out um, where students could log in and get uh, meetings with our counselors. So this is really, really important to us. And we also are, are deeply aware of the impact that our students have and how hard it is for many of them. So we have restorative justice approaches that we work on. All site administration has been trained on restorative justice. We are, um, when we return to class at the elementary level, we were working on some restorative justice circles as a way to kind of ease that transition back for students. We have social and emotional learning toolbox in K-5. And then in middle school, we have the second step program. I will admit that during COVID, it's been a little bit hard to really integrate fully the second step program like we want to, but we look forward to returning to that when we can. And then just in terms of overall mental health, we did check-ins with our elementary students. We make sure that our students have access to professional services. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is aware, but if you're using an Ohio Unified School District device and you were to Google um, or search for suicide, how do I kill myself, any of those things, we get that alert and we immediately um, put together a mental health team to support you. And we have those right now. We respond to those um, in, in a very timely way so that we can make sure that those students who are experiencing um, depression or sadness or just struggling have a, a caring professional adult who checks in with them. We also have um, services for parents. So parent, we have these support groups for parents who are just struggling. I triaged all of the help tickets. So if you go to our Ojai Unified website and you click on the help form, we get um, parents or anyone can submit a form for help. And a, a fair number of those, I mean, mostly they're for like technology, but a lot of them are for mental health support. And so we triage that way and for parents even. And then finally for our staff, we have an employee assistance program that allows them to have access to free mental health services and counseling, which sometimes is a little bit hard to access through your healthcare provider, if you have Kaiser or, or whatever, it's, it's just not always easy. And um, a lot of mental health professionals don't take insurance. And so we have this additional service for staff, all staff, regardless of if they um, are on our healthcare plan or not, where they can have access to free counseling sessions. 
So, and we just did a little um, training for staff last week about how to, how to access that. So looking forward, we wanna to continue to train and provide restorative justice practices. We are looking at the Living Works online suicide prevention training for students. So you heard from our student group that they are interested in providing mental health support to each other. And so we wanna make sure that our students have access to that training so that they can um, be on ground support for their peers. We are working on an iterative improvement process for our parent support groups. So as we get additional feedback from parents, we keep trying to modify those to meet needs based on what we hear. We are really um, working on student voice and student feedback. Last year, if you remember, we had a survey that went out mid-year and we were gonna have another survey at the end of the year. That didn't happen. Um, but as part of our regular student surveying, we have questions always about um, mental health and generally social emotional health. Do they have everything they need to be successful? Um, how do they feel connected to caring adults, that kind of thing. And then finally, uh, we presented in last month's agenda, the Healthy Kids Survey, and we are analyzing that so that we can see where we might have some areas for growth. Also, we are looking at the curriculum. So we explicitly teach anti-bias lessons. There are three lessons in TK through five and 10 in grades six through eight that are part of the curriculum. This year, we added new resources that came to us from the Guiding Coalition. So the Guiding Coalition has a curriculum subcommittee and they helped us with um, resources for Hispanic Heritage Month, culturally appropriate Thanksgiving. And then we'll do the same thing for um, Black History Month and Women's History Month so that we are building this repository of culturally appropriate um, resources for teachers to participate in those, um, those months. And then this last year, we added a new book, Land of Our Ancestors, as supplemental history curriculum. And then looking forward, um, once the state framework is approved, we will start moving forward with ethnic studies. We're looking forward to that. We're partnering and um, watching how that's going and doing some early thinking, but we wanna make sure that whatever we put together is in line with the ultimate framework that comes out. And then we, I am very excited about this. So Ventura County Indian Education Consortium is housed at Ventura Unified School District and they are putting together a program that will provide training and support to review district curriculum and also training and support to provide education on indigenous cultures to staff and educators. So we are excited to be part of that program and looking forward to, as they put that together, uh, we immediately responded that yes, we were, we were interested in, in that work. And as soon as they have that, we will be participating with them and with others in the county to do that work collaboratively. Um, our secondary, oh, so moving on to professional learning. Our secondary team attended a Beyond Conversations About Race Virtual Institute, and also Shelley attended that with the team. Just to start those, um, the thinking about equity, what is our equity lens? I actually, we took a Google Doc with lots of notes with everyone in the team that I refer back to frequently as we're doing this work. Um, last year, we had student panels at Nordoff. I will say this is probably our area that has been the most significantly impacted by COVID because obviously the majority of our time in professional learning so far has been um, related to technology, technology training, um, new software training, that kind of thing. So we can only train teachers so much. They, as you remember, we have six hours of, in a day and they have to spend a lot of that teaching. And if we take them out of the classroom, we don't have substitutes for them. So this is, you know, this is an area that we're committed to. It's just um, going to have to not be our, our primary goal right now this year as we're continuing to, to work through COVID. Um, but working on professional development. So the grant that we received, the state grant, No Place for Hate, is to pay for professional development. What we really wanna do is send our English and social studies teacher to a Harvard, um, online Harvard Institute that's about advancing culturally responsive literature. And then we continue to work in the PLC process. One of the great things about the PLC process is that um, there's some really phenomenal um, trainers and leaders in the country who work on equity as it relates to having 
high quality instruction for all students. And so as we continue to engage in the pre-LC process district-wide, there are a couple of people, Dr. Anthony Muhammad and Dr. Luis Cruz, who just do fantastic work in this area and um, that we continue to work with our staff on um, trainings, all virtual that um, come from them. And then finally, our guiding coalition is working, we have a subcommittee that's on events and we are working on hosting a series of cultural proficiency talks for the community, hopefully starting in January. And again, tying those with, um, you know, our Hispanic Heritage Month or Black History Month, those kinds of things. So we look forward to announcing those in the near future. Then looking at policies, this is a really important piece and it's very, um, this is something, this isn't something you do once, this is something you do every single day as things come up. So for example, translating the um, college and career documents that we just talked about. That was a huge task, but we we're committed to doing that work. So every day we have to remember to look at what we're doing through this diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. So one thing that we're really interested in is evaluating and eliminating um, gatekeepers to advanced coursework. So something that just happened this week is we had a discussion with our secondary team, middle school and high school, about um, the English nine honors and how students get into that. And it, in the past, we've had a test and the test is administered in class. So it's a writing assessment and it's timed. And that has some um, unintended bias there against people who may not be native English speakers, right? If we're giving you a timed writing assessment to determine if you get to continue into an honors program. And so there's another way to do that, which is just taking that same kind of assessment and putting it in a non-timed environment so that students can take as much time as they want. And I would say, you know, I take forever to write and I'm not, you know, translating in my head. I'm a native English speaker, speaker, but, you know, sometimes it'll take me an hour to write a really good email. So if we want students to be able to um, fully show us what they're capable of, we need to just think about how we are doing those assessments and change those. And so overall, this is the work that we are doing and continuing to do around those um, gatekeepers and having as many students as possible um, have access to our advanced coursework. Um, Mariachi, we realized that we support band financially, but we did not have a fund specifically for Mariachi. So we're working on that, translating all documents, and then we are looking forward to after COVID um, returning to our Spanish language acquisition pilot. If you remember, you approved that and then uh, just was not feasible at this time in this year. And then working on evaluating our HR and hiring practices um, to recruit and retain diverse staff. And then finally, strategic planning. Our guiding coalition is beginning the process of developing an overarching strategic plan that includes stakeholder input and measurable objectives. We have a couple, a couple of districts have done some really good models of this. And so we're looking at what they've done and seeing how we can adjust that to fit what we need to do in OHI. And then just a few partnerships that we're really proud of. Secure Beginnings, um, which also runs the Diaper Bank, has uh, received a OHI Women's Fund grant for an anti-bias, anti-racism um, work curriculum in early childhood education. And so we will be partnering with them and, and doing that at a place to grow. If you remember, we had Jordan Perry and an alumni who ran the diversity book drive. We continue to work collaboratively with the Ojai Alliance for Equity and Education and then the Ventura County Indian Education Consortium. So I know I was going quickly, but I, we've had a lot of presentations tonight, but if you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. Okay, no questions. Thank you for the presentation and uh, some exciting things to look forward to. We know that's that's a continue a process that continues. Um, item seven, which is our consent calendar. I do have a public comment on that from Jim Johnson. Consent calendar regarding 7.1.4 of $50,000 for enrichment program at Rock Tree Sky on Summit School Campus for STEM, art, and other elective services. I think more transparency and explanation is required on why the school district is funding Rock Tree Sky. 
Why have the students of Rock Tree Sky returned to classes and are apparently enjoying enrichment classes when our own Ojai Unified School District children have not returned to school and cannot participate in enrichment classes? So are we addressing any of those questions since it was on the agenda? It's an agenda item. So the, the item is actually on a blanket purchase order. And so there is a blanket purchase order for $50,000 um, for students who attend Rock Tree Sky. So I, I would say, I don't know that it's an agenda item. I think it, it the item is about the blanket purchase order. So we could potentially, if you, I mean, I can tell you that we have um, an agreement with Rock Tree Sky to provide extension services to um, students who are enrolled in Summit, and it is $50 a day. We've reported that in public to the board before when we originally started Summit and just recently, and uh, $50 a day for up to two days per week. And so this is just a purchase order that would allow, I don't know if it'll be $50,000 or not, but we generally encumber that money so that we don't overspend um, at the end of the year. And so for the number of students that are attending Rock Tree Sky, and I don't know at this exact moment how many it is this month or how many days a week they're going, but um, that is why we have that $50,000. As to whether or not, uh, they're, why they're open and all that other stuff, I don't know that that's an agenda item, if that makes sense. Uh, I think the comment is, is wanting sort of an explanation of how uh, those students are receiving some enrichment that maybe our, our students who are in our regular classes are not. So I think that is worth a future discussion. And I think maybe we'll, we will talk about that at the end of the evening. Yeah, I, I was going to suggest such a thing. So we will talk about it during my board report. Okay. So I did have a, a quick question about one of the um, items, which is the name change at, at um, summit and I apologize for not uh, asking earlier I just noticed it or paid attention to the what I think is a bit of a difference um Tiffany is I, I remember vaguely remember that at some point we were talking about independent school and it was not it was difficult for for the younger kids but one of the aspects of this is that we're the independent school is now going down to TK is that do you know what I'm talking about wasn't there some conversation about whether independent school could be done for for the younger kids or am I miss miss it, uh, it can be done for everyone that was a, a public comment but it wasn't um it wasn't true you I and what, yeah I think what the, the conversation was was that it, um independent for uh TK through five Kevin was um parent led it's more like a homeschooling uh, because the, the students can't do it independently. And then six through 12 was more of an independent study program. But because of, of COVID, I think we've, we've combined it all into Summit. And I, I think we're going to be keeping it that way in the future. But um, I don't know if that, I think this, this is was a, a comment. Sorry, I, you know, sometimes I read something and I don't even know where I heard it. So yeah, yeah but I think this is just, a, we have already <clears throat> approved this. It just was the, the language was not correct for us to file it. So it's kind of just a revisit. If there aren't any questions, do I have a motion to approve? I'll move to approve the consent agenda, consent calendar. A second. Thank you, Michael. All those in favor? Shelley? Aye. Michael? Aye. Kevin? Yes. Rebecca? Aye. Jane? Aye. It passes five to zero. 7.2.1, human resources consideration of permanent bond maintenance position. So you, re you had approved earlier in the year, and I don't have the exact date in front of me, a bond position, maintenance position, it, and it was temporary. So it was for three months, and that was before we had measure K pass. The idea is that there are a lot of jobs that we can save funding on if we can do them in-house at a much cheaper rate than having a contractor come out and do them. So for example, um, this last week, because we don't have this position currently or anyone in this position, 
I signed a purchase rack for painting that would have been, you know, a few hours for one of our people and was several thousand dollars. Same thing with a welding purchase requisition for a, I don't know, a banister. It's not the right word, but uh, railing. Um, things like that where we have to pay somebody to come out and do little work. But if we had a permanent bond maintenance person, um, they would be able to do that at a, at a greatly reduced rate. We are convinced that we have enough work to keep them busy when we had, we've had two different people in this position since you approved it. They continuously leave because it turns out when it's a three month position, that means that you're just take this job while you're looking for another job um, that's more permanent. So, but in that time that we essentially were piloting it, we were able to fully utilize that person um, in, a, in a number of different ways, doing all kinds of projects in support of specifically Measure J projects um, that, that we didn't have to then call in a, a company to do. So the, I, the ask is for this position to become um, permanent, meaning that it will annually be renewed because it's tied to categorical funding, but that we would have a um, full-time position rather than just a three month long position. I'll move to approve. Is there a second? I, can I just make a comment that I, I think it's a great idea and it's consistent with uh, this board's decision to move away from a construction management firm, charging us on a percentage basis for everything we did under Measure J to having uh, bond managers. And I think it's, uh, the, the, it's an efficiency and it's smart. I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor? Shelley? Aye. Michael? Aye. Kevin? Yes. Rebecca? Aye. Jane? Aye. That passes five to zero. 7.3.1, approval of Chromebook purchases. This is part of our CARES money, I believe. Um, I don't know, are there questions about this or? I'll move to approve. A second. All those in favor, Shelley? Aye. Michael? Aye. Kevin? Yes. Rebecca? Aye. Jane? Aye. That passes five to zero. We are at the first interim. It Jane, is Jane, can, can I ask for a, a, a short uh, yes. break? Can we take a break? <laughs> oh, it thank is, you. Uh, 8.08. Um, do we say 8.15? That's not quite 10 minutes. Maybe 8.18. <laughs> We will we'll take that. We'll be back in 10 minutes.
Waiting for Kevin, I think we're all back. Okay, we are all here. We will continue with 7.4.1, approval and certification of the first interim report. Tiffany, did you wanna introduce this or shall we go, is Tiffany back? I assume, she, I assume we're looking at her screen. She's back, but she was muted, I think. Yes, and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't find the unmute because I was in the, in the slideshow. Um, I have a slideshow which I can present or due to time, would you rather take questions? What would you prefer given where we are in our evening tonight? Um, I don't know that we need um, this first thing, reporting cycle. I think we're all fairly familiar with the process. Um, the attachment, um, did, did uh, anyone have any questions concerning if you, if you, uh, is your slideshow, does it kind of give the, um, sort of those first? Yep. They're just charts from the memo that, um, for discussion points, but everything that you would see here in my presentation was more thoroughly described in the memo that was part of the attachment. So I, I can I can do either one. I just want to be sensitive to the fact that we have a lot of items still to go. Does anyone have any discussion that they particularly like to just hear about? Um, we know we received um, an increase in revenue. I assume that is our um, COVID funds. So. Yeah, so we're, we're up about our total revenues were plus about $2.1 million. Some of that is COVID. Some of that was other things like summer school, for example. And then our expenses, of course, we are spending our, our COVID funds on COVID related expenditures. So those are, are going to be essentially a wash at the end of the day. Um, we continue our projections at the end of first interim are that we have, uh, we still have a significant um, ending fund balance, goes up to about $2 million. You'll see in the multi-year projections that we have some layoffs in out years. That's always, that's not new to you. You see that every year where in order to um, balance our out years, we always project layoffs, but um, we have a, more than a million dollars or actually almost a million dollars, $942,000 in our restricted programs in our projected ending fund balance. And so, um, you know, we, could potentially reallocate funds and, and not need to do layoffs, but we wouldn't know that until a little bit later in that budget cycle um, when we get to the governor's budget and the, the May revise and all of that cycle that we go through. So we're pretty early to be looking at out year projections, um, especially given if you remember the last board meeting, I mentioned that there is a state surplus this year and so who knows what the budget will look like next year and, and if those would actually materialize. But for this year, our first interim shows that we are on track. Um, we're not over in spending. We're not over in staffing beyond what we've added for COVID. It does look like, though, that our, our, two, our projected layoffs two years out are higher than they have been in the past. That's the highest I think I've seen them. Yeah. It's because we conservatively budget with, you know, no COLA and high increase in, you know, our um, health and welfare. So <clears throat> lower enrollment. So one of the things that we need to do between now and second interim is really look at what does our enrollment look like this year and square that with our enrollment projections for the future. 
based on the students who are showing up in the district today and where they look, where they are in their cohort moving forward. Right, so if we know we have less students in fourth grade or, or for example, so it's time to do a reassessment of our enrollment projections based on where we are right now. And for anyone following at home, that's 11 of page 11 of 128 that Shelley's referencing where we're showing 2022, 2023 with a, a full-time equivalent reductions on the teacher side of 8.5, classified 6.3 in management 1.35, right? Right. And if you look at that, that is really related to the fact that we're projecting at that point 100 less students. So, of course, if we have 100 less students, we would have fewer, fewer teachers and staff to, to serve those students. And I would like to, you know, when a couple of years ago when we had a couple of these, you know, as we got closer to the reality of this, rather than having a, a year out there that was huge, we tried to, um, you know, kind of take some of those losses in, in the earlier year. So it wasn't so extreme. Sure. So we'll just know more about that. It's really hard right now in this fiscal environment to project any kind of out years because we just, budget's so unstable. We don't know how we'll be funded next year. Um, you know, one of the things that everybody's concerned about is this year, we have across the entire state, there are way fewer um, free and reduced lunch applications despite our best efforts. And that's how you receive um, many of your federal funds are based on those applications. And so um, we're you know, working on that, but hopefully there will be some change to how that funding works at the state level since we're not the only ones who have that, that issue. So it's just early to tell what that will look like in the future. Early to tell and very uncertain, broadly speaking, in terms of the whole fiscal budget. So we have kind of a double whammy there. Right, so I'm gonna assume that um, members of the public can click on the attachment and read it and study it the way we have. Again, our um, revenue sources are up, our spending is up, but our bottom line is better than where it was when we made yep. these, uh, when we looked at these numbers at the end of June. Yes. Or is it better or just the same? Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, that's wrong. It's ending fund balance is, I'm sorry, increase in fund balance is up 155, but we're down because we had less to begin with. In early, uh, early July, our, our beginning fund balance was down $258,000. Um, so I'll show you the page, sorry, five of 128. I'll show you, this is from adopt, yeah, from adopted to first interim. The other thing that's helpful is this slide that I'm showing you now, which is our general fund summary at our first interim. And so you can see that our beginning balance was about 1.6 million. And then at the end of the of our revenues, our expenditures um, are unadjusted is about 2 million. So yes, our, our ending fund balance is up when you look at both restricted and unrestricted. That chart is in your packet as well. It's in the memo and it's on page um, eight. Do you have any other questions? And I'd like to thank Taiwo for being here tonight and for um, preparing all of this. It is such a tremendous amount of work to put together first interim, um, as well as doing an analysis of where we are in COVID funding and our audit and all the other things that seem to happen kind of at the same time of year. So he's been working very hard on all of this. Considering all the changes we know will happen because the, the fiscal state of the state is where it is and, and we don't really know. I'm um, grateful for the information, but I'm sure there will be more questions as we go further, but I don't have any at this time. Do I have a motion? 
I'll move, move. to approve the first interim. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> All right, you got there. <laughs> I'll second. All those in favor? Shelly? Aye. Kevin? Yes. Michael? Aye. Rebecca, you have lost you. There you are. <laughs> and Jane, aye. That passes five to zero. Thank you, Taiwo. Uh, 7.4.2, Maryland, local control funding formula, budget overview for parents. Okay, mine's not really so interesting like Dave's with Nordoff and the inclusion and equity. I mean, I hate to always follow that because that's always so interesting. But before I um, take questions, I wanna give you, give the board some Pur the purpose of and the context for this LCFF budget overview for parents. And it was established as an assembly bill a couple of years ago, and it was really to give um, additional transparency, fiscal transparency, especially for stakeholders. And the statute requires the budget overview use language. And I know this is always a big deal with these, these uh, templates language that is understandable and accessible to parents and that it display information using visuals and graphics. And I think you can kind of see that in the three page document. So it is pretty accessible for um, the lay person, not an educator, not a fiscal person, but the lay person. Now, local governing boards are typically required to adopt this in conjunction with the LCAP each June, but of course we're not in typical times. So tonight's presentation is just a one-time occurrence as part of those changes in accountability due to the COVID pandemic. So for the 2020 budget overview, adoption is required on or before December, whereas it usually is June, in conjunction with that first interim budget report. Um, after during the summer when Senate Bill 98 was passed and they waived the 2021 LCAP and changed the adoption submission date for this overview to December, but the template was also modified. So now you'll notice that it includes three things that we don't usually have in the budget overview. The first is that specific amount of um, federal funds that are allocated to the district under the coronavirus aid, relief, and economic security, the CARES Act. Then it also includes total expenditures in the learning continuity plan and total budgeted expenditures for those unduplicated pupils, those high needs pupils in the learning continuity plan. So those were three modifications that we've not had before. So then following the adoption, it just, it, like always, it will be submitted tomorrow because tomorrow is December 15th, um, tomorrow to VCOE, and then it will be made available on the um, district's home webpage. So I am here to answer questions. If you have any. I, I didn't I have, have any. I don't have a question, but I do have an observation that uh, is really complimentary. Again, I see more language about how we're looking at the individual needs of our students. And and I just I just want to say thank you. I think that's has to be a hallmark of OUSD um, and, and 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 do more. Yep, I think that's the, the lens through which we need to look at everything we do. Marilyn, I've heard a lot of people, you know, just in the country and but specifically here too, so worried about learning loss. And um, I don't know if this, this is really a question for you, but I, I, it just, I just wonder, you know, what, what have we seen of that? Have we, is it too early in our year to sort of kind of gauge what's happening? Yeah. It you know, that is a concern. It's a concern nationwide. And we have funds, the learning loss mitigation funds to help. But we do need to develop some metrics to determine, okay, how were they last year pre-COVID? And then how are they now with the new either distance learning or hybrid? 
And I think it's something that as administrators we'll have to be working on is to get some metrics to really determine what is the learning loss and how can we identify it. So it's not a question I can exactly answer, but I know it's something we're really looking at. I can add to that a little bit. I know that for elementary, it's been difficult. Well, actually for K-12, it's been a little bit difficult uh, to really guarantee that what they're getting is authentic assessment, given that kids are at home, especially in the early year learning years. Are the parents helping a little bit too much with the assessment they're trying to give? And so it's it's not exactly clear where the students are at. I know we got some more accurate data for the few weeks that kids were on campus, which is terrific. Mm -hmm. um, going into January and February, we're going to be using the interim assessments in third through eighth grade for SBAC. So we'll be able to see a little bit more data there and get a better glimpse of how our, our students are doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for Marilyn? Do I have a motion to approve? I'll move to approve and thank you, Marilyn, for preparing that for us. You're welcome, always a joy. Second. Thank you, all those in favor, Kevin? Yes. Shelley? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Michael? Aye. Jane? Aye. That passes five to zero. 7.4.3, uh, approval of resolution authorizing an increase in the maximum amount of borrowing funds for fiscal year. I think this was, unless there's questions, pretty straightforward. Is this the 8,000? Um, we had five that approved 8 million, sorry, and now we're upping that to, gosh, it's late <laughs> already. We had approved 5 million and this is upping it to 8 million because our funds from the state and government have not come in. Is that I'll move to approve. I'll second. I'll second. All those in favor, Shelley? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Sorry. That's all right. Kevin? Yes. And Michael? Aye. Jane? Aye. That's five to zero. Uh, 7.4.4, certifying the results of the Measure K bond election results. Any questions or a motion? I'll move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor, Kevin? Yes. Michael? Aye. Shelly? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Jane? Aye. That passes five to zero. And I think it's worth noting just for the general public that um, we're jumping on this now so that we can get the interest rates that are at rock bottom prices right now. And it still won't be seen on the... Um... That's actually the next item, Shelly, yeah. the next item. Am I jumping ahead? I was yeah. like, oh, we're on a different item, I didn't know it. <laughs> Certifying the results to the Board of Supervisors that- Oh my gosh, I did, I jumped ahead. The bond was approved by the voters. That's all we're we're certifying that- Okay, we'll certify it and then we'll let you know about the next. So 7.5 7. <laughs> is to authorize the issuances of the bond. And I think that is worth just a couple of minutes of um, discussing why we are issuing them the bonds now because interest rates are so low. Tiffany, I don't know if you wanna say something or- I do. So the, the goal is to issue our first um, issuance of Series A bonds for Measure K. We are allowed to do that because federal tax, tax law allows municipalities, including school districts, to issue bonds and to capitalize interest for a period not to exceed three years. So that's why we were able to push out our um, collection of taxes, but we can still sell this series of bonds right now. The general consensus is that we feel like interest rates are going to go up. And so we wanted to take advantage of selling these bonds. We have three years to spend them, um, although we could potentially extend that, but we feel like in three years, we'll be able to at least have um, encumbered or have all of these funds under contract with given some of the major projects that we have forthcoming. You should see next month um, a Measure K overview of the projects that we're um, proposing coming to you in January.
Yeah, and I think you spoke really quickly, but I think that, you know, an important part is that uh, we had committed to not collect taxes um, um, until, was it 2022? I, I don't remember the exact it's the time. end of 2022, right? It's December. And yeah, then... and, and so what you're saying, I think, is that we are going to issue these bonds and then presumably during the interim, we'll pay the interest on the bonds from the proceeds of the bonds and not be collecting money until 2022. Thank you for that clarification. I'll move to approve. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Uh, Kevin? Yes. Shelley? Aye. Michael? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. And Jane? Aye. That passes 5 to 0. 7.446 public hearing and approval of resolution annual and five-year accounting. So first I'll take a motion to open the public hearing. I'll move to open the public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Kevin? Yes. Michael? Aye. Shelley? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Jane? Aye. That's five to zero to open the public. We do have a public comment on that from William Wyrick. The rationale for imposing development fees on residential housing as laid out well in the Ventura Unified School District report titled Education Code Section 17620 Fees Jurisdiction, I'm sorry, Justification, is to help finance expansion of existing capacity insufficient for anticipated rising enrollment. The board is being asked to continue with the development fee applying to ADUs over 500 square foot, even if the unit has existed for decades and is getting a health and safety check for permitting under the second unit compliance program. In other words, for a district with an insufficient enrollment problem and well-documented excess capacity, board members are being asked to approve a fee which is not consistent with the underlying rationale for EC 17620 and which suppresses the kind of activity which most believe would help alleviate the district's problems with long-term enrollment trends. I do want to comment on that. What we're actually being asked to do tonight is to approve the, um, the uh, fiscal fund, what we have in there and what we are have spent and what is still in the account. We, are, we actually had a resolution to continue to collect the fees last January in early 2020. And we will revisit that again in January of 2022. Um, I believe at the time we looked at it in January, there was some concern that since we have declining enrollment, why would we continue this? Which again, we could certainly revisit again in a year, but we are collecting what is titled, let me find it here. Um, Let's see, sorry. Fee, Tiffany, I don't know if you, you know, the fees have different, they're like fee one, fee two, fee three. There's different, there's different tiers. Tiers, thank you. And tier one, which is what we're collecting is described, if I can find the page, I should have marked it for myself. Um, pull it up for you if you'd like. Sorry. Oh, thought I had it. So I I think Jane, what you're um, so do you want to go through the different the three different? Well, yes. Yeah, so I was just going to read um, level one fee currently applies to OHI and the state sets the maximum amount that districts eligible for level one fees can collect. These fees are revised in January of each even numbered year and were last revised in January 2020. Um, districts can impose these fees for school facilities. Um, relating to the school's ability to accommodate its enrollment. So even though we might not be um, 
increasing our enrollment, we are serving a current enrollment that still we still need to make sure that our facilities are able to handle the current. That's my understanding of it. Yeah, and so if I could share one of the things, so this again is a is a backwards looking um, accounting document. It is not saying that it's not anything about continuing to levy the fees. It's saying you are asked tonight to approve the report on the funds that we have collected and have spent. Um, we've been very cautious with these funds because we weren't sure if Measure K would be on the ballot, if we would need these funds. Um, and we wanted to really think about the use of these funds in connection with Measure J and now Measure K. And so, and also the development potentially of the district office property. So all of those go into play about how we would potentially use these funds. And so we've been um, conservative with them. If these were the only funds that we had after Measure J, then we would use them differently um, than we likely will now that we have Measure K. So you're right, Jane, it doesn't necessarily tie directly to, for example, classroom space. There's other things that are constantly, um, that we would potentially need these for, things like additional bus lanes or parking, things like that. Now that people, you know, as they move further away from downtown, it may be that we need to think about how we're, you know, transportation issues relative to that. So there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, I'll be bringing a future agenda item to propose that we do a new developer fee study. It's time for us probably to do that. And then we would bring that to the board um, along with an item for consideration of fees and what those look like and what amount we would potentially want to consider levying. So that's all future work to do. This is that's not this item that's before you tonight. So I would like to get a motion to close the public hearing. I'll move to close. Could I just ask a quick question on that? Sure. Tiffany, um, remind us, what are, this is a segregated fund, right? How, how, how is this segregated uh, money different from, you know, other infrastructure money? Like what are the, you know, what are the su subject, what's the subject matter of its uh, spending? So there's a lot of specific requirements about what you can use this on and not use that on it. I would need to do a little bit of preparation to bring you a, a list or to be able to answer all of that. Um, it is it is fairly complicated. And so I know there's a lot of, um, you know, I generally check with legal counsel, like, is this something we would use developer fees on or is that not an allowable? Um, it's not super cut and dry, but I, if you'd like, I can prepare that and send it to you after the meeting. I would also add that this is like one of the few uh, facilities funds that we have, right? The majority of our money. <laughs> <is it. laughs> yeah. I mean, now we have, we have uh, measure J, but the majority of the money that we get, we can't use on facilities funds. And this is like one of the things that, you know, school districts use to maintain their facilities, which is desperately needed. Thank you. I think, um, did I have a motion to close the public hearing from Shelley? Yes, I move. I'll second it. Okay, all those in favor of closing the public hearing? Uh, Rebecca? Aye. Shelley? Aye. Kevin? Yes. Michael? Aye. Jane? Aye. That closes the public meeting five to zero. Any other comments on the resolution from the board or questions? I'll move to approve the report, the resolution. I'll second. All those in favor? Michael? Aye. Kevin? Yes. Rebecca? Aye. Shelley? Aye. Jane? Aye. That passes also five to zero. We are at 7.4.7, .7, Measure J update. Good evening. Hi, Adam. Hi, how are you? Well, How you're not Chase anymore. You're, you're, when you first logged in, it said Chase. I know that is the uh, a byproduct of a whole lot of distance learning. Yes. So, <laughs> um, so Alan and I did not do our uh, monthly PowerPoint with all the pictures this month. We thought next month we'll do one. It'll have a little more ooh and ah with uh, the library getting very close, the dining hall wrapping up, San Antonio. Um, so, 
just real quick to hit a couple of the highlights. Obviously, the library is getting very close. Um, the flooring's been polished. Uh, Alan can jump in on these. Obviously, Alan's been there every day as well. Um, and the dining hall is extremely close, and it's it's it, it's looking very very good, and it's very exciting. I know Francis asks us, I think, three or four times a week how close we are. Um, <laughs> And then San Antonio again. San Antonio is obviously going, undergoing a, a massive uh, facelift to the parking lot and flow of traffic and everything. Everybody who drives by there um, asks us what we're doing, but uh, it's going to be a huge change at the front of that school as well. So I would say those are the big, the three biggies that are um, that'll be a lot of fun to to wrap up in the coming weeks or months. Yeah, San Antonio has come along pretty yeah. quickly. Uh just muted myself. San Antonio's come along pretty nicely. Um, we did have a few days of delay while we got some permitting uh, processes going through the county and the uh, county inspector out. Uh, that held us up a little bit, but we're moving again, moving ahead now. And uh, <clears throat> we should be uh, cutting into the bus lane next week or later this week. And uh, very shortly, we'll be uh, finishing the, the actual asphalt paving uh, for all three areas of, that are under construction there. So. Uh, yeah, happy with that. Um, the library is moving, moving forward and the, the Matillaha kitchen, uh, we're waiting on a couple of last pieces of equipment that we're slow getting here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's wrapping up. We're doing things like testing the airflow on the HVAC units and things like that right now. So um, things are coming together. <clears throat> um, any other questions on anything on the update? Uh, we've kind of ramped up or kept kept going, obviously, um, especially with the passage of Measure K. Uh, it's been pretty exciting for Alan and I. We have all kinds of stuff on our whiteboard going on right now, so it's pretty fun. And it looks like, you Put know. That on, the, on the photos next time, picture of your whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> we will, <laughs> definitely. Fortunately or unfortunately, you'll have a nice dry winter to get lots more done, it looks like. Yeah, it's what it's sounding like, unfortunately, but. I was thinking about that this time last year, at the December meeting last year, we were approving the, the repair of a broken electrical line at Matilla Hall. <laughs> we were coming out of the rain and, and uh, they were digging the hole for the, for the uh, foundation at the kitchen and it was raining everywhere and it, it, was, a, it was a mess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, any other questions on anything on the update at all? We'll move on to 7.4.8. Thank you, of course, for your work on those projects. Ratification of the construction for Miramani restroom upgrade project. Any questions? Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Rebecca? Aye. Kevin? Yes. Michael? Aye. Shelly? Aye. Jane? Aye. That passes five to zero. 7.4.9, approval of the KYA service for Matillaha flooring. I'm sure the teachers are excited about that. Hopefully it'll look as good as our elementary schools. Any questions? Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve. Can I just make a comment that um, I want the Nordoff teachers to know that they are not left out. <laughs> we've now done all of the elementary. This is the middle school. We've done some it. And so we're coming for Nordoff as well. Um, they're just next. They're the biggest, so they take a little bit longer. So uh, the, I think the samples are laid out for us to choose from and they're, we're, they're coming, so. Thank you. I have a motion from Shelly and Kevin, were you doing the second? I was trying to move, but I'll take second if I have to. <laughs> Uh, all those in favor? Kevin? Yes. Michael? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Shelly? Aye. Jane? Aye. That passes five to zero. 7.4.10, approval of skate park. Oh, I'm sorry. So that's good. Good night, Adam and Alan. I think that's it for you guys, right? Thank you. And uh, thanks again for approving the uh, the skilled maintenance position to full time to a permanent position. Yeah. I think we can do a lot of good with that. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you and enjoy your holidays. Thank you too.
Okay. Approval of the skate park lease renewal with the city of Ojai. I know we need a little discussion here. Um, although the current lease still has three more years on it and we in the past have um, renewed the lease, I think for six year increments, the Pretty city- nice, It depends, yeah. City has asked for a 20 year lease to be approved. I thought in the resolution it said, or in the new lease, that the last lease was from 20, uh, 2000 till 2023. It is. Right. Uh, I thought you were saying previously we were going with seven years. Oh, I'm sorry. There's three years left on the, on the lease. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. That one was. I just had read the history of it and there was a few that were, I guess they're all over the place. Yes. But they're asking for a significant length on this lease. I know there was concerns, um, members for the 20 years and then there was questions about why this is coming to us now versus two years from now. And um, I think there is some concern of members of the public since the project of downtown, the district property that the skate park would be included in that? The skate park is not included in, in any part of the proposed development. It's, it's excluded specifically from our exclusive right to negotiate. And so there's no um, chance that the skate park would be included in our, in our current RFP and development work that's being under being considered. I do have questions and concerns as to why, why, why now, um, why this is coming to us. Uh, it feels like a push from the city and I don't have um, a clear understanding of why. I wish that, you know, when it was requested from the city that there was an explanation as to why the, we, why they were interested in having the lease renewed now instead of in three years when it actually expires and um, the, why the need for 20 years, because I'm very unclear about that. Did any, uh, did anyone, I mean, I assume they've, they've ratified this? No, it, it is going to the city council next. Um, we started with you since we're the, the landowners. Um, it, the, At some point, someone contacted the city manager, I assume a city council member and said. Yeah, I, I'm not sure on their process, but they did reach out to us and uh, the city manager and I have been working on it. They sent this proposal over. Um, I do know that the reason for 20 years is because there's some grant funding that is only available, especially if you're operating something on leased property that uh, requires a longer lease before you could be eligible for grant funding, right? They don't wanna give you grant funding, millions of dollars in a grant funding for you know five year lease on a property, for example. So the 20 years makes sense. I'm, I'm unclear about why um, the push is to renew it now, given that we have so much time still. I'd like to suggest that we push it to a future date when the city can come and tell us, you know, what their thinking is on this. Um, I think that would be really helpful. And since we don't have any immediate um, apparent need, certainly I would I would think it would be a significant thing if they're if they're trying to get some grant money and they can tell us about that and and we can contemplate all the you know all the the issues that that way. I think it would just be. Uh, we'd have a fuller record upon which to make this decision. It's, it is a really long time. I would also have one question. I was looking for the language and I wasn't finding it. Um, in, the, in the cover sheet, it talks about expiring unless sooner terminated. And, uh, and so I was looking for, oh, so is there language that would terminate this sooner? And I'm, I could just be blind and missed it, but um, I would ask somebody to sort of help me on that, on that too. And I... I would agree with what Kevin said that I would like to see documentation or because this is long after any of us will probably be in office for committing the land to the city. So I would like to see why the push. 
You're not <laughs> planning on serving for 20 years, Rebecca? <laughs> <laughs> Only when you were it. Right? <laughs> okay, I've heard three people then recommend a postponement with more information from the city. So I'm going to move on. So that's. I, uh, I think not just more information. I think Kevin, I, I appreciated, I think what I heard you say that if um, Mr. Vega from the city wanted to give a presentation and talk about it, that might be helpful. So we can ask questions to the city. Um, I think that would be a useful part of the issue. Just for the record, I will share that this um, agreement was, we did have our legal counsel review this agreement and they found no issues with it. So if that provides you with any solace about that, that doesn't answer the, the time frame question, but I did, did want to share that. Yeah, just for myself, um, in, on, on, in general principles, I have no objection to extending the skate park, but the 20 years is a long time. Um, I do see an escalation of, of, of rent clause. So, I mean, that's in there. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious as to, yeah, why 20 and why now? Just full information. Great. Thank you. We'll move on to 7.5.1, the first reading of board policies for July. The way we have done this in the past is we just have someone yell out, I have a question on page whatever. And if anyone has anything before that, they speak up. My first question is on the moment. I'll pull up the pull it up so we can at least follow along and the public can follow along. Um, my first question is page five. Does anyone have anything before that? Um, my question, um, it just, it's not really a question, it's just, um, it's talking about annual civil rights trainings for frontline staff in the treatment. And I'm just wondering if we, we have that, are we going to, is I think paragraph two, the district shall annually provide mandatory civil rights training. Moment. Um, we do do all of the mandatory trainings that are required in nutrition services, so. Um, I think it's part of our whole training package. So generally our nutrition services, we have a few hours before we come back to school um, that they're required to do training. So I think it's incorporated into that. So am, am I correct in inferring that most of these mandatory changes are because of the, the, the rewrites of Title IX and- Yes. Yeah, okay. So we may not do that yet if it is new, but it will be incorporated into whatever mandatory training we do for all nutrition services. And those on page six, those justice for all posters, is that something that exists already or? No. So we have to find those and purchase them, right? Uh, I think they send them to us, but yes. Mm -hmm. They're not going to go well with our new, uh, our new beautiful posters that we've been working on, but yeah. <laughs> I have a question on 15. Does anybody have anything before that? Come on guys, you're making me look like a, <laughs> okay. Where's Thane? He always did this with me. Page 15, number four. Oh, how often is our employee handbook updated? I was just kind of wondering. Might be something. That's necessary. So with these, I mean, which just might be something to, you know, kind of put on a little note somewhere. It's like, hey, when was the last time that was updated? And maybe right. um, number five, um, where's my question? This training is all mandatory and we do it through um, Armitus. I'm actually glad to see the bystander training here expressly. Page 28. Um, 
emergency removal. Oh, I, I just, the way it's worded and I'm, I'm sure this is, it, it sounds almost punitive to the student, like if it's a student, like, oh, we're gonna remove you from that class because you felt harassed there. And I kind of feel like, I know that, you know, we can't prove yet that there was harassment. So you don't wanna remove a, a staff member or a teacher, but I just, I wonder if there's, if, if you can speak to that at all, or if there's any thoughts on how that would be handled. Like would a student maybe be moved to another section or to a different class or rather than being removed? Right, potentially they would, it, it depends on where, where we are and what other options we have for the student, right? But doesn't the weight fall on the respondent and not moving the complainant, right? I.e. The, the complainant is like the victim. And, and if I'm reading this correctly, it's the respondent that can be, can be removed or placed on leave, which would be the person accused. Right, so if a student is harassing another student, right, we might remove that student. The alleged harasser. Right. And it would depend on the specifics of the situation. It would be very, you know, individual, con contextualized. Right. But just in terms of our restorative justice, I, I think we're, we're better prepared for maybe handling that. Yeah, I mean, I think we would legally, though, do what we need to do, um, and it might be a case for restorative justice, or it might not, right? Depending on what the what the claim is. You know, for example, if there were physical violence between two students, we're not going to wait and work through the restorative justice process. We're going to remove somebody from the class. Okay. Page fifty-eight. Any comments before that? Questions. So much of it was um, mandatory that I, I ended up with very few questions. Yeah, and a lot of it was the same. Oh, I would just like to add to the annually um, our gun safety uh, information. Just for Rebecca's clarification, we do this a little different than other districts do. So if it's red, it's a mandatory change. If it's green, it's something that you could change. And if it's black, it's what already exists. So generally when you're reading through this, uh, the red is so that you don't have to bother thinking about or wordsmithing that because that just kind of is what it is what it is in terms of what's required. So it's great to hear. <laughs> Which is way better than when I started because there was this abbreviation on the side and I spent hours trying to figure out what NUA was. <laughs> Any new wording okay. thing? Okay, new word. That was it. Okay, N W. And I thought, I searched all over. You can't Google that. <laughs> I had my next question is page 134. You know, before I, I did have, and I just, I'm having trouble pulling it up in front of me, but on page 93, I'm gonna go back. I tried to put this on a Google doc so I could make notes on it and it didn't work so well. But there was a shell that I thought should be a uh, May. I was gonna play Thane since he's not here. Like, are you on it? Well, okay, you're faster than I am. The superintendent or designee may develop strategies to supplement physical education instruction with additional opportunities. I am supportive of that may not shall. <laughs> For sure. Any, anybody wanna argue for the shall? I'm good with that. I'm good with the may. On page 134, anybody have anything before then? Um, On-site visits. Um, I was wondering, do we do that with our charter students? Do they have to, do we have to have? 
no, we don't have to go visit a site before a charter student. I, you know, like so, if if a student's at um, Valley Oak and they're as a special ed student, they're being placed somewhere that we haven't been before. Do we have a requirement for an on-site visit for those students? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, might might be something we need to find out. And that's the end. And that's just the first reading, yeah? Right, do we have um, a desire, since we only made one change from shall to may, and then the second change would be adding gun safety. Is there any, are we, would, would we like to waive the right to a second reading? I'll move to approve these and waive the right to the second reading with the um, mentioned changes. I'll second. All those in favor, Michael? Aye. Kevin? Yes. Shelly? Aye. Rebecca? Aye. Jane? Aye. That passes five to zero. No second reading required. 7.5.2, uh, board member reports. Anybody see something, witness something, want to discuss something, share something? Is this? Uh... We still have future agenda items will be next. Um, I just want to say thank you. And I am very excited to be here and to serve on the board. And I want to publicly thank the people who voted for me. And um, I really look forward to working with you guys. So that's all. <laughs> Chuck Welcome. gave you some applause. <laughs> We're very happy that you're here, Rebecca. Welcome. Thank you. And thank you, Chuck. <laughs> And last item, 7.5.3, future agenda items. Kevin. As, as I mentioned before, I, I would like to have an agenda item regarding, I guess, regarding enrichment opportunities in the general population. I mean, I think we're certainly seeing how popular the enrichment that's offered up at Summit is right now. And I think that we have a real opportunity to sort of expand and um, on those kind of offerings for the general population down in the valley. So I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, to have a, an agenda item on that subject. Yeah, and I think it's um, for, you know, most um, urgently for COVID, but just in general, it's, it's uh, the kind of, I think it kind of ties into some of what we're, we've been talking about with our goals. You know, how do we add some of that Enrichment. Exactly. Do you see, um, I mean, would you like that, Kevin, at, at the January or? As always, I mean, we're constrained by uh, staff resources, but, the, you know, sooner the better. Like you said, I mean, I do think there is a window we might be able to do some things right now in the COVID environment, particularly for kids that are looking for ways to get uh, in person, uh, in some environment. I think that's, I mean, the public comment, um, it's, it's funny because the, the law that we were discussing last year with Kim Rivers was to ensure that students who were independent study also were enriched and, and that they got the same opportunities as our students on campus. And now because of COVID, we're looking at it and saying, well, are they getting more than our our general population students. And that's what we wanna make sure is that there's equality. And possibly through, we've kind of done that in uh, Ventura Unified through small groups, through a coalition of the willing with teachers who would be willing to come to campus and teach enrichment in small group type settings. I don't know if that's possible to do here, but it's been highly successful for our kiddos there. Uh, it's a it's an option for all teachers. Our coalition of the willing are doing what they're willing to do right now. <laughs> gotcha. I think that's a great idea. I mean, I, I that that's exactly the kinds of ideas that I was thinking about. Um, I I would like, and and this may be already planned, uh, Tiffany, uh, on the equity report. 
is that going to be like a quarterly thing that we can revisit? Um, and, I, and I'll tell you why, because, you know, at work, we're, we're being asked to look at everything that we do through the equity lens, and we're struggling to define what that actually means. Um, but as opposed to being a separate agenda item, um, you know, I mean, our lowest performing students are economically challenged for, uh, kids. And, and so, you know, the, the equity lens would say, how are we approaching that? Anyway, I, I don't know what would be in it, but I am thinking that it's something that we probably, I would like to hear on a regular basis, how we're, how we're managing to spread that throughout our programs. Great, Michael. Anything else? I'm looking at the parking lot. Um, well, technology is hopefully coming up at the next one. Yep, okay. That looks like it. So I think we are done for this evening. Happy holidays to everyone. Welcome to Rebecca. Thank you everyone for being here. Happy holidays and welcome, Rebecca. And thank you, Kathy, for taking the notes. We thank will you see you all in January, unless we have an emergency meeting next week uh, in regards to our uh, closed session negotiations. Special meeting. Special, Special meeting. meeting. Sorry. <laughs> Which it, it is likely that we will have. But Thank you all. Good night. Good night, everybody. Have good, good holidays. Night. Stay safe.